In June 2021, on the 32nd anniversary of the 1989 student democracy protests, which, as we all know, ended in the horrific Tiananmen Square massacre, I visited Liberty Sculpture Park in Yermo, California, to witness the unveiling of a sculpture made by artist Chen Weiming. It was a 20-foot-tall statue that morphed Xi Jinping's skull with a coronavirus molecule, and Chen named it the CCP virus. It was a bold work of art, rightfully assigning blame to the CCP and Xi Jinping in particular for the horrific pandemic and all the mistakes that were made, especially in the early months uh, that shook the world. I was, <clears throat> I was honored to attend to see Chen's work and to join him and other heroes of the Chinese democracy uh, in speaking out against the atrocities committed by the Chinese Communist Party. Less than two months later, however, the sculpture was gone. It was vandalized and then burned to the ground, likely by a band of CCP agents targeting Chen and other Chinese democracy activists here in the United States to punish and scare them into silence. At the ceremony, there were Chinese Communist Party agents in attendance. Unfortunately, Chen's case is not a rare case. With us today, uh, with us that day in Yermo was Wei Jing Chang, perhaps the greatest advocate for Chinese human rights and democracy of our time. Very few people know this, but in May of 2022, while driving right here in Washington, a car swerved in front of Wei's car, suddenly braked in front of him while another rammed him from behind. Both cars quickly fled the scene. Wei believes, and I also believe, that this was an attempt on Wei's life. This, incidentally, is the same tactic that I have heard used over and over against other Chinese individuals uh, who have run afoul of the CCP. And the list goes on. Major Shi Yong Yang, uh, who served in the US Army and who ran for Congress in New York City, was stalked and harassed by Chinese agents here in the United States. Pastor Bob Fu, who I've known for over two decades, a leading advocate on behalf of Christians and human rights activists and defenders trying to escape China, was threatened with a bomb at his home in Texas. The brave eight Hong Kongers, whose heads, heads the authorities have placed on bounties and harassed with their families just this past summer, solely for speaking out against the atrocities happening in their beloved Hong Kong. Indeed, I know that group includes a number of individuals whose outspokenness led them to testify here at the China Commission, so this is really personal for all of us on this panel. It also becomes personal when I hear about fellow uh, legislator from a sister democracy who has been harassed for speaking out about human rights in China. Member of Parliament Michael Chung of Canada was harassed for what Senator Merkley and I have repeatedly done, calling the Chinese Communist Party's treatment of Uyghurs what it is, a genocide. And although Michael has been harassed, he is not in any way, shape, or form intimidated. And he is joining us today at the witness panel, will be the first panel uh, to, to speak to us today. My friends, the Chinese Communist Party has waged a pervasive, coercive campaign around the world against anyone who does not agree with the party. They target Uyghurs, Hong Kongers, Tibetans, dissidents, activists, students, journalists, or anyone who dares to state their unapproved opinions about the People's Republic of China. The Chinese Communist Party uses modern technology to digitally harass and surveil individuals around the globe. They abuse the Interpol system to punish and return those who exercise their freedom of speech while abroad. They detain and harass dissidents, families and friends back in China, to unjustly attempt to coerce silence, like the sister of Rushan Abbas, who will join us here this morning in panel number two. And they even use direct physical assaults beyond their borders to control what is said and about their country and its wrongdoing. Recently, we've seen them go so far as to set up shop right here in the United States establishing illegal police stations here in New York City to surveil and harass Chinese immigrants on our soil. The Chinese Communist Party's strategy of trying to rewrite global norms has succeeded in far too many cases. This has led to self-censorship and curtailment of basic freedoms even here in the United States of America. Students scared to speak out, journalists scared to write, free citizens scared to attend gatherings, all of this happening beyond China's borders and within ours. 
Indeed, as Michael Chong's testimony illustrates and as underscored in news just this past weekend from Great Britain, where an alleged spy worked in Parliament, it is also happening within our legislatures. We cannot and will not let the Chinese Communist Party in any way intimidate us or scare us into submission through these tactics. Today, we will hear from experts and victims alike who have seen these stories up close. We must work to protect freedoms of speech, assembly, and opinion, both here in the United States uh, as well as elsewhere, and including in the People's Republic of China. I'd like to yield to our distinguished co-chair, Senator Merkley. Thank you very much, Chairman Smith. Transnational repression is central to the Chinese Communist Party's strategy of silencing critics of Chinese policy around the world. It affects so many of the Uyghurs, the Hong Kongers, the Tibetans, the human rights advocates, the journalists, and others. This commission works with on a daily basis. This hearing gives us a chance to give a platform to some of the victims and experts from across the globe who have been most engaged in trying to identify ways we can address this vexing challenge. We know from past testimony that it isn't easy, as the Chinese Communist Party's sophisticated tactics seem to know no bounds and bring the power of a ruthless state against individual dissidents, members of Chinese diaspora, and insidiously their family members in China. That's why it's so critical that we redouble the efforts to wrap our minds around the dimensions of this threat, to raise awareness globally, to identify ways to build common cause with those who have been targeted, religious groups, activists, journalists, politicians, as well as governments sick and tired of the brazen violation of sovereignty and transnational rep rep repression represents. Last year, I chaired another hearing on this topic to hear about what the Biden administration is doing about it, and I'm proud that one of the officials at the forefront of that work, Under Secretary Azrazea, is now one of our commissioners. The State Department is dedicated and is continuing to apply significant time and attention to develop a more comprehensive strategy to counter, deter, mitigate these threats. We have also seen the Department of Justice make important strides in pursuing criminal charges against groups and individuals accused of engaging in transnational repression. But despite these efforts, this Commission's reporting shows how far we have to go. We continue to track a disturbing number of cases of transnational repression, both here in the United States and abroad, with the knowledge that countless others are taking place and likely not being reported on. I imagine that for every case we hear, there's another 10 we don't know about. We have seen egregious harassment campaigns, even against legislators in the world, including Honorable Michael Chong, who is here a member of the Canadian House of Commons. We have seen relentless targeting of young activists who have spoken out bravely against the increasingly repressive conditions in Hong Kong. And we have seen the unrelenting pressure that continues to be directed at Uyghurs around the world. We know this is, as Freedom House calls it, the most sophisticated global and comprehensive campaign of transnational repression in the world. It relies on surveillance technology, spyware, threats to individuals through phone calls or face-to-face -face intimidation, and even harassment of family members and friends back in China. As Safeguard Defenders revealed in an eye-opening report earlier this year, the PRC is also responsible for establishing at least 102 overseas service stations in at least 53 countries, breaching national sovereignty and coercing Chinese diaspora members to return to the PRC for criminal investigations. All of this requires that the United States and as many other governments as possible and we do need international cooperation to make this effective, make it a priority to address this issue. That's why earlier this year I introduced the Transnational Repression Policy Act, joined on a bipartisan basis by my colleagues, Senator Rubio, Senator Cardin, Senator Haggerty, and the Senate, to hold foreign governments and individuals accountable when they stalk, intimidate, or assault people across borders. I appreciate Chairman Smith's work to lead the House companion to this legislation if enacted, the Transnational Repression Policy Act would mandate additional U.S. government reporting on the issue, require training for U.S. diplomatic and law enforcement personnel, 
bolster intelligence community efforts to track and share information on these incidents and develop a more effective tip line for victims and witnesses. I'm working to get this bill passed. I think it's essential that we do, and I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today who are bringing their experience, their story, to bear on this very important issue. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, Merkley, I'd like to now yield to the ranking member, uh, Jim McGovern. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I, I join my colleagues in welcoming the witnesses uh, today um, and the public uh, to CECC's hearing on uh, transnational repression. Transnational repression occurs when governments reach across borders to silent dissent among diasporas and exiles, including through assassinations, illegal deportations, abductions, digital threats, Interpo Interpol abuse, and family intimidation. Our focus today is on the practices of the People's Republic of China, but transnational repression can be carried out not just by unfriendly governments, but also by strategic allies. It can target people anywhere they or their families reside or visit, even in democracies like the United Kingdom, Canada, Germany, Australia, South Africa, and here in the United States. That's why I worked with Senator Merkley during the 117th Congress as he led the development of the Transnational Repression Policy Act, and why I'm proud to co-lead the same bill, H.R. 3654 in the House, uh, this Congress with Chairman Smith. It is critically important to make sure that the United States government has the tools it needs to confront this global challenge, both domestically and internationally. I turn now to China. Freedom House's database on transnational repression now includes information on 854 direct physical incidents committed by 38 governments in 91 countries around the world since 2014. China is an, is an origin country for 253 of those recorded incidents, a stunning 30 percent. As we will hear today, the PRC targets abroad the same populations it represses internally especially Uyghurs, Hong Kongers, and Tibetans. State agents linked to the security and police forces have engaged in forced rendition of asylum seekers, street assaults, digital surveillance, online harassment, and the coercion and intimidation of family members and friends of dissidents. We must be sure that we have the knowledge and the capacity to protect the people who are targets of these practices, especially those who are within U.S. jurisdiction, and we must do a better job of engaging with partner countries and strengthening multilateral strategies to counter the PRC's actions, which violate international human rights, among them the right to freedom of expression, association, asylum and freedom of movement, and the prohibition on arbitrary detention. So I look forward to this hearing uh, today. I thank the witnesses again, and I look forward to uh, hearing their recommendations. And with that, I yield back my time. Thank you very much. It's my honor to, you know, this commission, as I think all of you know, or most of you know, is not only bicameral and bipartisan, it also includes distinguished members of the executive branch. We are joined by one of those members, Under Secretary Yuzera Zaya, and I yield the floor to her. Good morning, and thank you, Chairman Smith and Co-Chair Merkley and Ranking Member McGovern and fellow commissioners. I'm honored to be with you all today for this important discussion on the increasingly pervasive and concerning use of transnational repression by PRC authorities. Transnational repression, or TNR, is a global phenomenon, but the PRC's efforts are especially pervasive, pronounced, and persistent. The PRC uses TNR to harass and threaten Uyghurs, Tibetans, members of other ethnic and religious minority groups, Hong Kongers, and PRC citizens and non-PRC citizens living abroad who seek only to exercise their human rights and fundamental freedoms. As, we, as we've heard from the co-chairs and ranking member, the PRC utilizes a wide variety of tactics, including online harassment, exit bans, or imprisonment of family members of targeted individuals, the misuse of international law enforcement systems such as Interpol, and pressure on other governments to forcibly return targeted individuals to the PRC. 
The sheer breadth and depth of their efforts cannot be ignored and should not be permitted to continue. It is a direct affront to national sovereignty and impacts people all over the world, including U.S. citizens and individuals residing in the United States. This is why, since 2021, the Biden-Harris administration has made combating transnational repression a global human rights priority. One way that we've sought to counter this scourge is through our diplomatic engagement and tools. We continue to engage the PRC directly, making clear in no uncertain terms that their conduct is acceptable, is unacceptable, and must stop. We have not, and we will not keep quiet in the face of these transgressions. We've used sanctions as an accountability tool as well. Specifically, in March 2022, we imposed visa restrictions on PRC officials responsible for or complicit in transnational repression. This administration energized the interagency to combat TNR in the United States as well. U.S. government agencies have increased their domestic engagement with domestic communities targeted by the PRC. This outreach helps to create improved two-way communication, which both enhances our understanding of the threat and helps those affected more quickly access government assistance when they are targeted or even before this occurs. We've also jump-started international cooperation to drive a global response because it's not only Americans and U.S. residents who have suffered abuses. Specifically, we deployed interagency teams to meet with foreign counterparts to raise their awareness of this threat and to share our own lessons learned. One example of this effort is the recent launch of a G7 Rapid Response Mechanism Working Group on TNR. This coalition will raise international awareness of the threat TNR poses to democratic values and deepen our shared commitment to countering it. The experiences and details presented by today's panelists will surely highlight the very real threat of the, T of the PRC's transnational repression activities, as well as the need for governments, legislators, activists, and others to continue to work even more closely together to counter it. Hearing your stories, and in some cases, learning from what you have gone through personally are vitally important as we advance our common cause. The administration welcomes Congress's ongoing leadership on these issues, and we look forward to further deepening our collaboration. Thank you again for this opportunity to speak, and thank you all for coming together today to confront this challenge. Madam Undersecretary, thank you very much for your leadership and for joining us at this hearing today. It's now my honor to uh, yield to Senator Sullivan, a new member of the Commission. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your uh, outstanding leadership on this. It's great to see my, co uh, my, my colleague from the U.S. Senate and the co-chair, Senator Merkley. Uh, this is such an important topic, the effort often successful of the Chinese Communist Party to reach far beyond its borders to target critics in, in the diaspora communities throughout the world is outrageous. But let's face it, it's just one of many outrageous things Beijing is doing across the board. As this committee has done an excellent job of doing, we need to continue to recognize and highlight the brutal nature of the Chinese Communist Party regime we are dealing with, especially under the dictatorial rule of Xi Jinping. Look no further than the string of strange disappearances that we've seen in China, in their government, in the last couple of months. The Chinese for foreign minister and former ambassador to the United States disappeared. This was Xi Jinping's right-hand man until recently the commander and deputy commander of the PLA rocket forces, gone. Now, apparently, the defense minister is gone. Who knows what's going on here?
But to be clear, this is the sort of regime we're dealing with, a regime whose officials suddenly disappear without any explanation. They're probably somewhere in China with bullets in their heads in ditches. This is the way the CCP operates. And now Xi Jinping is trying to export this. Just a couple months ago, authorities in Hong Kong issued arrest warrants for activists and lawyers accused of violating the CCP-imposed national security law, specifically for people who no longer live in Hong Kong, or anywhere in China for that matter. Hong Kong has declared it will pursue these people for life. And it's not unthinkable that they could one day make good on grabbing them. Of course, I'm not worried about the United States aiding in their return, or the UK, or Australia, or Japan, or other places where they now reside. But life is long. They all travel. One day they could find themselves in the hand of a government all too eager to burnish its credentials with Beijing. This is one of the reasons, Mr. Chairman, I'm working with Representative John Curtis on a bill to press the Biden administration to sanction the prosecutors and judges and other officials responsible for enforcing these unjust Hong Kong laws. The days of the independence of the Hong Kong judiciary system and the rule of law in Hong Kong are unfortunately long gone. Beijing has seen to that. Now we need to do what we can to try to even up the scales on behalf of the people of Hong Kong. Mr. Chairman, there's one more issue that I want to just raise in my opening statement. These kind of aggressive actions are also targeting Americans directly and even remarkably during times of tragedy. I'd like to submit for the record this New York Times story that just broke last night entitled, China Sows Disinformation About Hawaii Fires Using New Techniques. That objection, so well. This story that just broke in the New York Times talks about how when wildfires swept across Maui last month, killing over 100 Americans, the CCP unleashed its information warriors. They said on the internet the disaster was not natural. In a flurry of false posts and lies that spread across the internet, they said the natural disaster was the result of a secret weather weapon being tested by the United States military and intel agencies. To bolster this lie, they posted photographs that were generated by artificial intelligence programs. Mr. Chairman, as we all know, when countries around the world suffer natural disasters, even adversaries come together to help each other, not under Xi Jinping's rule. The Chinese Communist Party is now trying to sow discord among Americans as we sadly bury our own dead in Hawaii. This is outrageous. And I call on the Chinese ambassador to the United States to formally apologize to our country. But Mr. Chairman, he won't. Because if he did, he'd disappear too. We all know that. One final thing, Mr. Chairman, I just want to say how honored I am to join this commission. It, is such a great, it has such a great history, especially under your leadership. At a time when many people are raising questions about Congress's decisions in the past relating to China, for example, extending MFN 20 years ago, it is good to remind Americans that at the same time, the Congress also established organizations like this one to keep a critical eye on human rights. I think there may be more Congress can do to live up to this commission's mandate, perhaps even expand it. But as the new guy here, I'm eager to learn from my colleagues about how the commission works, and I'm very honored to be part of that. With that, Mr. Chairman, I again, I'm very glad to be here and look forward to working with you and all the members of this distinguished commission. Thank you so very much, uh, Commissioner, and for your very eloquent remarks.
and welcome to the commission. We're so glad Thank to you. have you. I'd like to now recognize uh, Congresswoman Commissioner Salinas. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can be brief. I just want to thank you, um, the co-chairs, for this today's hearing. Ranking Member McGovern is critically, critically important. I want to thank the, the witnesses for coming here to testify. And um, like our newest member, I too am eager to, to continue to learn and really hopefully figure out what some tools are to, to provide some accountability around this. This is um, a, sounds like a global problem and something that is not just affecting human rights, but also affects um, the way we do business globally and around the world with trade. So I wanna thank you all um, for conducting today's hearing. Thank you so very much. I'd like to now recognize uh, uh, Commissioner Ryan Zinke. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and Senator Merkley for holding this hearing. And on this side of the aisle, we have the Marine and Navy team. We'll, we'll try to do our best. Uh, but, Mr. Chairman, on June 24th, uh, 2012, Dr. Shane Truman Todd, a young American engineer, was found hanging in his Singapore apartment a week before his scheduled return to the United States. Although Dr. Todd had repeatedly expressed fear about the work he was doing from A and to a Chinese company, authorities immediately ruled his death a suicide. His family initially didn't know what to believe. However, this started to change when they arrived in Singapore and evidence seemed to suggest murder and not suicide. The narrative changed when they discovered what they had thought was a speaker was actually an external hard drive with thousands of backup files from Dr. Todd's computer. What the data revealed by those files changed the narrative from a tragic suicide and loss of a son to an international story of deceit and cover-up. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter chapter 11 of Mrs. Todd's book entitled Hard Drive, A Family's Fight Against Three Countries to the Record. That objection so ordered. And if uh, any member would like hard copies of it, we will certainly make those available. But I yield the balance of my time uh, to, and I look forward to hearing your testimony, uh, Minister Chong, and thank you again for holding this hearing. Thank you very much. Uh, before I introduce our very distinguished member of parliament, I just want to point out that a number of us met with um, the wife of Lu Xiwei uh, several weeks ago. Uh, he is in Laos and it's not looking good. And my hope is that the Laotian government will rethink a forcible repatriation of this amazing man back to China where he faces a very, very terrible future. Uh, in meeting with his wife uh, and all the human rights organizations have rallied behind him. Uh, there's a total solidarity there, I'm happy to say. Uh, she couldn't have been more persuasive, uh, loving towards her husband, and she made it so clear that if the West and all countries uh, in the democracies don't speak up, uh, his future is so bleak. So my, all of our appeal would be to the Laotian government that they, uh, uh, that now they, they cease and desist any kind of forcible repatriation. Uh, this commission is very honored to welcome the Honorable Michael Chung here today as he will testify to the depth of the levels that the Chinese Communist Party has gone uh, in its transnational repression campaign, going so far as to attempt to coerce foreign members of parliament in countries with strong democratic roots simply for speaking out against human rights atrocities. Mr. Chong was first elected to the Parliament of Canada in 2004 and represents the riding of Wellington Halton Hills. He is currently the Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs for the Official Opposition and Vice Chair of the Special Committee on the Canada People's Republic of China relationship. Mr. Chong has served in the Federal Cabinet as President of the Queen's Privy Council, Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, and Minister for Support. For support. For support. Uh, for Chang, he also served as chair of several House Commons standing House of Commons standing committees. It is a true honor and a privilege for Mr. Chang to join us today. Uh, through though it's unfortunately due to the unacceptable and outrageous overreach of the Chinese Communist Party, after calling CCP's treatment of the Uyghurs 
what it is, a genocide. Mr. Chong receives threats personally, and members of his family living in Hong Kong have been targeted as a result. Chinese Communist Party not only seeks to silence its critics at home, but has gone so far as to has harass thousands of people abroad for speaking the truth about their totalitarian regime. As a fellow legislator, my colleagues and I are appalled at the attempts to censorship you and others who have bravely spoken out, as you have as well. Uh, we welcome you, and please consume however much time you would like. Thank you, uh, Chairman Smith. Thank you, Co-Chairman Merkley, Ranking Member McGovern, Senator Sullivan, uh, Representative Salinas and Zinke. Thank you very much for having me in front of your commission today. I understand that you're interested in my experience of Beijing's transnational repression, or what we also call foreign interference. Like millions of Canadians and Americans, I'm the child of immigrants. My mother immigrated from the Netherlands, and my father immigrated from Hong Kong. I've extended family in both the Netherlands and Hong Kong. I've been elected since 2004 to represent the district of Wellington Halton Hills, and have served in the federal cabinet and chaired several parliamentary committees. In 2020, I was appointed the official opposition's shadow minister for foreign affairs. Since then, my criticisms of Beijing have increased in response to President Xi's increasing violations of the rules-based international order and its repression in the PRC and abroad. In November 2020, I introduced a motion adopted by the House of Commons calling on the Canadian government to make a decision on Huawei, on Huawei's involvement in Canada's 5G network within 30 days and to develop a robust plan to combat China's growing foreign operations in Canada and its increasing intimidation of Canadians living in Canada. Several months later in February, I introduced another motion which the House also adopted, recognizing Beijing's actions towards Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims as a genocide. In May this year, I learned that a PRC diplomat working out of the PRC consulate in Toronto had since 2020 been gathering information to further target me and my family in Hong Kong. Last month, I learned I was the target of a disinformation campaign in May of this year on the Chinese social, on the Chinese language social media platform WeChat. The Canadian Department of Foreign Affairs concluded that Beijing's role in this information, this disinformation operation was highly probable. But my experience is but one case of Beijing's interference in Canada. Many, many other cases go unreported and unnoticed, and the victims suffer in silence. This has serious implications for the approximately 4% of Canadians, some 1.7 million Canadians of Chinese descent. Beijing targets these diaspora groups using a variety of tactics. One tactic is to target the many Chinese international students in Canada coaching them into participating in foreign interference threat activities on university campuses, such as targeting pro-Hong Kong democracy activists and Tibetan and Uyghur human rights campaigners. Other tactics include targeting Chinese language media and social media in Canada, the establishment of illegal police stations in Canada, the wrongful detention and arrest and detention of Canadians, such as Michael Kovrig, Michael Spaver, and the currently detained Hussein Jalil, whose whereabouts is completely unknown. And another tactic includes coercing Canadians on Canadian soil back to the People's Republic of China. Recently, the PRC has used a tactic of creating wanted lists and offering bounties of the arrest of those from Canada. These various tactics are a serious and concerted effort to interfere with democratic activity in Canada and leave millions of Canadians at risk of being intimidated, coerced, silenced, and unable to enjoy the basic democratic rights and freedoms guaranteed in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in our Constitution. These tactics cannot be tolerated in a free and sovereign country. Canada must work more closely with democratic allies like the United States in countering Beijing's efforts to interfere in our democratic life. 
Foreign interference is a serious national security threat to Canada. It threatens our economy, our long-term prosperity, social cohesion, our parliament, and our elections. It requires a suite of measures to combat, including closer cooperation amongst allied democracies. Canada must work toward a stronger defence and security partnership with the United States and allies. We must look for every opportunity to strengthen this partnership, to meet the challenge of rising authoritarianism, and to preserve our fundamental freedoms, our democracy, and the rule of law. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Chung, uh, for your excellent testimony and for your leadership. Uh, just a couple of questions, and I yield to my colleagues for any questions they might have. Uh, when you talked about closer cooperation, uh, are, you, are you persuaded that we are cooperating now? Is it as robust as it should be? Uh, and what is being left undone and unaddressed? Well, thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Smith, for that question. I, I think there are a number of ways in which we can uh, cooperate in a better way. So, for example, uh, the United States has long had a Foreign Agents Registry Act since 1938. Australia more recently introduced one, in, I think, in 2019. The UK just adopted one two months ago in July. Uh, the Government of Canada has announced that it's taking a look at introducing one in Canada to give law enforcement a tool to prosecute Beijing's agents operating on our own soil. And so I think there could one way in which we could better cooperate is ex exchange information on legislative best models. Um, to see what works and what doesn't. Um, we have similar uh, judicial systems uh, in our democracies. Um, so that's one area of cooperation. Another area, for example, is how do we use sunlight and transparency to counter foreign interference threat activities? Our security agencies and services, our experts have told us that often foreign interference, transnational repression doesn't rise to the level of a criminal prosecution. Um, and so one way to counter it is to make it public, to go public with uh, the intelligence, to tell members of the public, members of Congress, members of Parliament, here are, here's what exactly is going on, uh, to arm citizens and elected officials with the information they need to protect themselves. So best practices on how to do that um, during elections and between elections. So those are just two examples of where I think we could more closely cooperate. You know, I mentioned a list of things that had done to people that I know, that we know as a commission, who have been outspoken. I would point out that Anna Kwok, who is here today with us in the back, uh, she has testified in the past here, this year, on behalf of uh, Hong Kong. She has a bounty on her head. I mean, there's no let up by the repressive tactics employed by Xi Jinping. Uh, and even Chen Quan Zheng, who I worked uh, to help release years ago, uh, they, they meaning he assumes it was the Chinese Communist Party, in order to send a message that they were watching, um, went into his home when he and his wife and family were out and rearranged everything. They didn't destroy anything, they just rearranged it to let him know we've been here. Uh, Rabia Kadir, the great Uyghur human rights activist, similarly uh, has had one instance after another. And I'm wondering, you know, looking at you, here you are, high profile. Uh, you know, member of parliament, and yet they're doing this against you. You know, I was put on the hit list by Global Times a couple of years ago. I was briefed by the FBI. It nowhere nearly comes to what you're going through, believe me. But they said, watch out for social media, watch out for other things that they may do. Uh, uh, they refused to give me a visa. Uh, I'm trying to put together a trip that would go to Xinjiang uh, after their foreign ministry said, we have nothing to hide. Anybody wants to come, come. I, we sent a letter to the embassy and said, I want to come. Uh, please approve it. And we have not heard back from them since. Uh, but we're going to keep trying. I say this because, you know, you, the level of, of angst directed against you and you have family members at risk, uh, you know, we need to rally behind you and, and others like you who have family especially. Um, they could do a lot here. But to people in Hong Kong or anywhere else in the PRC, they could do a lot more. So um, we, that's why redoubling our efforts, passing this legislation, sharing best practices uh, is so important. You know, in reference to the PRC's different information campaign against you on WeChat, could you elaborate what that looked like? Yeah, thank you, uh, Chairman Smith. So what happened with me is that in May of this year, uh, while uh, a big debate was going on in Canada about foreign interference, 
um, a number of narratives, uh, false narratives about me, um, popped up on uh, Chinese language social media, on particularly on the WeChat platform. Um, and these narratives persisted for about a week, and the Department, the Canadian Department of Foreign Affairs concluded that they emanated from Chinese Communist Party accounts. Um, this is corrosive because uh, WeChat in Canada has over a million users, um, and some five million people globally, uh, including many in Canada, saw those, that disinformation. Um, and so they have weaponized uh, Chinese language social media, Chinese, uh, Chinese media such as uh, CGTN, uh, the, the state broadcaster. They've weaponized the targeting of radio stations and television stations. I know that in the UK, uh, just a couple of years ago, Ofcom, their broadcast regulator, pulled CGTN off the air, um, off of television because of uh, human rights violations and, and disinformation that was being spread. Um, so those are, uh, that, that's something I think democracies have to grapple with. Best practices on how to do that, I think, is critically important because one of the things we need to do is we need to balance our fundamental belief in free speech, free expression, free media, freedom of communication with the need to counter these, uh, this disinformation. Uh, Chairman Smith, you also mentioned uh, how the PRC is using money uh, to corrupt our system, and I think that's another area for cooperation. Often, transnational repression comes alongside corruption, alongside uh, personal illicit gain, um, payments of monies or consideration, money laundering. Um, and so I think uh, countering that money laundering, countering, countering the, the uh, proceeds of illicit uh, gain, I think is something where democracies also need to work more closely on. And, and the United States being the world's reserve currency and, and the U.S. dollar being the main means of transaction in our global economy, I think uh, we, can, we can do a lot together to counter uh, this uh, repression that takes in the form of uh, financial corruption. Before my time runs out, just two things. Is the Canadian government standing very, very in solidarity with you and everyone else? Uh, very briefly on that. And on the college campuses, what is the government doing, not the government, PRC doing vis-a-vis -vis, uh, minority religions? Yes, yeah, since, uh, since the spring, the Canadian government has been uh, standing up and, and supporting me. Um, I think before that point in time, uh, you know, there were issues that have popped up, but they are, they are now, like many other democracies, reacting to the threat. Um, you know, like I said, uh, the UK just adopted a foreign agents registry two months ago. The Canadian government has announced it will be introducing one. So, you know, democracies are often slow to react to the threat of authoritarian states, which can act much more quickly because it's one person or few people rule. Um, so, yes, they have been uh, supportive of me in, in recent months. Um, on university campuses, what is going on is that there are, um, I believe, over 100,000 Chinese international students at Canadian, Canada's leading research universities. Um, often these students are coached and coerced into participating in foreign interference threat activities on Canadian uh, university campuses. For example, uh, just a couple of years ago, there was a Tibetan human rights activist at the University of Toronto Scarborough campus. She had campaigned for president of student council. She had won that election, and she was immediately targeted by students through a coordinated effort by the PRC consulate. A similar thing happened at uh, the McMaster University campus in Hamilton, Ontario, where a Uyghur human rights activist was similarly targeted by students through a coordinated action of the PRC consulate. So these are the kinds of coercive activities taking place on university campuses. Thank you. Coach Aaron Merkley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And following up on that impact on university campuses, uh, in your testimony, you note that international students were compelled to demonstrate against pro-Hong Kong rallies after threats were made, quote, to withhold their government scholarships or harm their families back home. Um, in your estimation, uh, this, is a, this is not just a, a one-off. This is a, a systemic uh, strategy to use the Chinese students who are present uh, to essentially create a, a pro-China force on campuses? Yes, I think it is a systemic, long-term effort uh, to create fear on university campuses. Um, 
I just highlighted two examples of what has happened, but we've ha had many other, we've heard about many other cases on university campuses, and often the Chinese international students uh, who are, are, are conducting these activities are, are themselves being coerced uh, into doing it. Uh, not in all cases, but in many cases. And so, yes, it is a pervasive threat on university campuses. And uh, I've also read about uh, strategies that China is using uh, in which they essentially recruit some of the Chinese students to spy on other Chinese students who might be participating in uh, critiquing China's policies or, or participating in protests against Chinese activities in Hong Kong or uh, against Uyghurs and so forth. Is that something that you've observed in, in Canada as well? Yes, we have observed that in, at our committee uh, in the House of Commons. We heard testimony from witnesses uh, who highlighted uh, exactly that going on, um, that these students were being coerced into th spying on other students, um, threatening other students um, from the PRC um, who weren't uh, towing the PRC line and doing so under threat of having their scholarships withdrawn or their family targeted back home. Is there a, an, an effort to establish a channel through which uh, uh, students can report these strategies of coercion so we can get a better grip on how widespread uh, it is and, and ponder ways to address it? Well, there is a, uh, a, a, a number, a center that Canadians can call to report foreign interference threat activities, but I, I don't think it's broadly um, made available to Chinese international students or, or promoted amongst that community. Um, again, it's an area where we could learn from each other on best practices on how to counter this threat and where I think allied democracies can learn from each other on, on how to counter this. Also, in your, I'll shift gears here from the campuses, and, and thank you for those insights. Uh, to you, you note in your testimony that there's significant influence in Mandarin language news outlets, and um, you know, I, I would have thought that often those news outlets um, in our democracies would be a, a place that would kind of particularly be interested in reporting on, on China's uh, abuses, uh, but they're being co-opted. What is the strategy being employed there? Why is it effective? Well, I think the strategy is, is multi-pronged. So for example, um, there are state broadcasters from the PRC that are on the airwaves uh, in democracies, such as CGTN. Uh, the PRC state broadcaster. It um, often uh, promotes the propaganda right out of the Chinese Communist Party, um, and you know that those um, those broadcasts are are seen by millions of people around the world. Uh, they often uh, people close to the Chinese Communist Party leadership have often taken ownership of newspapers and. Uh, radio stations, and we've noticed that there's been a shift in the editorial stance of those newspapers. So, for example, Tsingtao Daily is the largest Chinese-language newspaper in Canada. Um, its former editor is Victor Ho, and he has told us in testimony in front of our committee uh, that um, the newspaper is largely now a vehicle for Chinese Communist Party uh, propaganda and views compared to when he was the editor where it was truly an independent newspaper that uh, operated uh, freely of any control from Beijing. I think that's a really an important point and but is it the Chinese government that's buying these these outlets? Is it Chinese corporations or, or affluent Chinese individuals? How are, how are they securing ownership control? It's not directly owned by the state. Uh, these are uh, individuals, that, though, that these are assets that have been purchased by individuals that are close to the PRC. Um, you know, for example, we've seen recently that the, in, a couple of years ago, that the South China Morning Post, the largest English language newspaper in Hong Kong, changed ownership. And there are suggestions that its editorial stance has changed uh, because of that. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I just I want to close with the question as to 
to, to whether any of your family back in China have ever been threatened as a result of, of your conversations? Well, that's, uh, that is, that my, ex my experience is, I think, illustrative of what is happening to, to many Canadians and Americans and other citizens of other democracies. Out of an abundance of caution, I've cut off contact with my family in Hong Kong um, in, to, in order to ensure that they are somewhat insulated from the work that I'm doing here. And I know in talking to members of diaspora communities across uh, Canada and in the United States that many, many uh, other people have done the same thing. And so this is, this is the consequence, one of the consequences of the PRC's transnational repression. And thanks so much. Senator Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Minister. Uh, welcome and thank you again for your courage for being here. What, what you're doing even as we speak in terms of your testimony takes an enormous amount of courage and um, I just want to let you know how, how much we admire it and appreciate it because it takes people like you to speak out even though you do so with threats and risks to your family. So really appreciate that. I want to just touch on a, a couple points that I raised in my opening statement, but your, your point about sticking together democracies, can you expand on this a little bit more, particularly in light of the fact that we've seen the Chinese Communist Party's strategy is to often try to isolate and single out certain democracies. You know, they were really, really pounding uh, Lithuania from an economic standpoint. Australia, they undertook this big coercive uh, economic, uh, essentially blockade. And can you tell just a little bit more on how important it is for all of us uh, as democracies to push back together, stick together, and that brings us power and strength, particularly when they try to pick off smaller countries, which I know is part of their strategy? Well, thank you, uh, Senator, for that question. Um, I mentioned how we can work more closely together on translating intelligence into public disclosure. Yeah. Our members of the public have talked a bit about, um, you know, uh, working together to figure out how do we counter disinformation during uh, targeting elected officials and our elections while still upholding fundamental freedoms of free speech. Uh, foreign agent registry is another area for cooperation. Um, talked a bit about how we can cooperate on transnational financial crimes, which often come alongside uh, foreign interference. But another area for cooperation is uh, combating repression within the People's Republic of China. For example, we know that much of the cotton and m many of the tomatoes produced in Xinjiang province um, in Western China are being produced through the forced labor of Uyghurs. Yeah. Uh, and we know that um, those products are being exported around the world. I think the United States has done an excellent job in enforcing bans on the importation of products like tomatoes and cotton uh, that have been uh, produced using that forced labor. As I understand it, some two and a half thousand shipments from the PRC in the last two or three years have been seized by U.S. Uh, border officials and prevented from coming into the United States. Um, the, in Canada, we've yet to seize uh, one shipment um, there was a single shipment that was seized but later released. We have evidence that those products continue to flow into Canada. And I think that's an area where we should learn from U.S. best practices on stopping these products from coming into our country. We're part of a North American free trade zone. We can't be um, the place where these products have a back door uh, to come in. So that is another example of where I think we could work much more closely with a democracy like the United States uh, to learn on how to implement these sorts of bans. Thank you. Let me uh, follow up on your points on transparency, working together. I also believe it's important, particularly for regimes like this that, you know, often only recognize power um, and threats to their own viability. As you know, the Con Chinese Communist Party's number one goal is to stay in power way above anything else welfare of their people, they could care less, as long as they stay in power. So here's another question I have for you. I also think it's important we go on a little bit of offense, right? Covertly, overtly, collectively, a lot of the CCP leadership we know is corrupt. We know they steal from their own people. We know that they're very rich. 
uh, from their corruption. Don't you think it makes sense, particularly like I'm saying is, is, is the Chinese are trying to sow discord literally as people in Hawaii are burying our fellow Americans. Just outrageous. That we should also go on offense, let the Chinese people know how corrupt their leaders are, that they're, they're all very rich because they steal from their people. Don't you think we should be going on offense covertly, overtly? You want to mess with us? Okay, we'll mess with you. And maybe we'll bring your leadership down. Don't you think we should be doing that? Well, I think that's uh, that's a very good point you make, Senator. I I think of um, you know past decades before the rise of the internet and modern communication technologies, where uh, shortwave radio was often yeah. used as a way to ensure that people in authoritarian states were receiving news and information that wasn't uh, the propaganda of the state. And I think in this day and age, uh, we should be funding VPN technologies that will allow people behind uh, great firewalls like the one in the PRC to access news and information from the outside world yeah. so that they actually get the truth rather than propaganda. Well, I think it's also very true, and I'm sure you would agree, that Xi Jinping's biggest weakness is that he fears his own people. That's why he's killing all of his close associates, or at least disappearing them. I don't know where they are. They're probably dead. Um, let me get back to this issue of the nature of the regime, because I think you understand it more than most. But it's often right in front of our faces, and we don't want to recognize it. Let me give you a broader example. You know, it's really interesting to me that you read Xi Jinping's speeches, you watch what he says publicly, you look at who he emulates. The guy emulates Mao Zedong, right? There's no doubt about it. He's trying to model himself on Mao Zedong. If, if you just do a little bit of reading of the history of Mao Zedong, he's one of the most brutal dictators in the history maybe of the world. The Black Book of Communism estimates that he killed probably 50 to 60 million of his own citizens. And the current leader of China emulates him. That would be like the Chancellor of Germany emulating Hitler. So what does it say about the nature of the regime that the current leader of China emulates one of the most brutal dictators in the history of the world? Shouldn't we be concerned about that? But shouldn't it also be a lesson for us? Yeah, I think it should be of concern to us. I think um, the rising prosperity of authoritarian states, such as the People's Republic of China over the last 20 years, has given them the resources to export their model of authoritarianism around the world, um, whether it's in the South China Sea, uh, whether it's in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, and I think we as democracies need to acknowledge that this is a very real threat. And I think we have, we have slowly come to this realization over the last decade um, you know, I think beyond 10 years ago, I think we, we wrongly assumed that along with uh, increasing prosperity in these authoritarian states, that they would gradually improve their record on human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. But the opposite has happened. All they have done is taken this newfound wealth and reinforced this authoritarianism using technology, using other methods to repress uh, their people. But going back to an earlier point you made about sunlight and transparency and disclosure, one of the things that we are based on is freedom of speech, freedom of expression, a belief in transparency and sunlight. Um, that is not something authoritarian states are based on. They're based on the very opposite principle. So I think by naming and shaming bad actors, uh, by using intelligence and making some of that public to name and shame bad actors, yeah. uh, I think we'll go a long way in countering this threat. Great. Thank you. Thanks again for your courage, Mr. Chairman. Thank you again, sir. I'd like to now yield to the ranking member, uh, Jim McGovern. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for your testimony. Thank you for being here. Um, you know, the, the, the concern that uh, is not just about um, social media outlets that China can control um, or has a greater influence on. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I, just, I just plugged in uh, to Twitter uh, Maui fire causes. Um, and things come up like from the Desert Review, whatever the hell that is, I have no idea. But basically, um, these are, these are um, it, it echoes the stuff that China's been putting out, you know, that, there, that somehow there's some mysterious causes to these fires. There's a number of posts. Um, I mean, it doesn't say Chinese government posted them. I mean, they, they obviously have sympathizers and people who promote conspiracy theories. 
Uh, but we have a problem, again, as, as a country that believes in free speech as a, you know, and freedom of expression, I mean, we have a problem on our own social media platforms with disinformation being put out there. Um, and in the case of Twitter now X, I mean, all the kind of review procedures that used to be in place are gone. I mean, we, we're reading about, uh, you know, the, the attacks on the Anti-Defamation League uh, that were raising issues about anti-Semitic posts that were being placed uh, on uh, online and uh, and the response to really try to destroy the integrity of the ADL is really quite, uh, you know, stunning. Um, and so it's, it's a how do you how do you get these these social media platform executives who oversee this to actually be more responsible? And so it's not just about naming and shaming um, the Chinese government, which we ought to do because uh, of what they're doing, but we have we have uh, corporate leaders that tolerate this, you know, um, in countries like ours. I mean, how do you? How do you get it? How do you get it? Do we name and shame them a little bit more? Well, uh, Representative McGovern, that's an excellent question. And it, this is where I think like minded democracies yeah. could really learn from each other on best practices and different models. So, for example, the European Union has a, a model to counter disinformation. The European Commission has set up a unit within the e EC uh, to counter disinformation in real time that's uh, springing up on social media platforms. Um, on the other hand, the, a very different model is the Taiwanese model. Uh, Taiwan is ground zero for the PRC's uh, disinformation operations. Both the PRC and Taiwan share a common language. Um, and so they are ground zero for uh, this disinformation. And they've taken a very different approach. I was recently part of a delegation to uh, Taiwan where I met with uh, Audrey, Audrey Tang, who's the minister, the newly new inaugural minister of digital affairs. And uh, she told me about um, their policy, um, which is a very different approach. It's grounded in resiliency. It's grounded in um, the education system, the primary and, and high school education system, and, and in civil society, empowering civil society groups to counter this disinformation. So this is where I think you know, we can learn from each other on best practices, on what works, what doesn't. Um, at the end of the day, we have to balance uh, two competing things. One is to counter this disinformation while upholding freedom of the media and freedom of speech. Yeah, I mean, and the, and the level of disinformation that is being peddled on various social media platforms, um, I really think is undercuts our democracy and, and, and our very freedoms that we all we care about. And it's, and it's always frustrating to me that we can't seem to come to a consensus on what disinformation is. And so we don't want to be in the business of censorship, but there ought to be some mechanism that clearly calls out lies and disinformation and conspiracy theories uh, and attacks on individuals, even if they're very subtle, for what they are. Um, and so I, I, you know, I, I think we, 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 this is a real challenge that, um, you know, some of it, you know, um, is, is, can be, you know, is pushing, putting pressure on China. Some of it is putting pressure on the platforms that allow people to um, traffic these lies um, and these threats on. Yeah, the other thing, I mean, as I, I said in the beginning, I, mean, I, I you know, I'm worried about attacks against people um, on these various platforms, but I am also, um, quite frank, frankly, very worried about the other uh, forms of uh, transnational repression, um, including um, assassinations, illegal deportations, ab abductions, and family intimidation and Interpol abuse. Um, I mean, the potential for the abuse of Interpol is well known and long standing. I mean, do you have any specific recommendations for reform of the Interpol system to combat transnational repression? Well, I think we do need to take a look at reforming Interpol uh, in light of you know, the bounties and um, a demand for arrest of eight uh, um, uh, pro Hong Kong democracy activists uh, who are abroad, I think. You know, we've got to make sure that Interpol isn't used as a tool by the PRC to arrest and detain these individuals. I think of a, a Canadian, Hussein Jalil, who was uh, wrongfully arrested in uh, outside of the PRC, I believe in Tur Turkmenistan, uh, a number of years ago, and then extradited uh, to the PRC, and his whereabouts is completely unknown. And the PRC won't tell 
uh, the Canadian government where he is being detained or even if he is alive. And his wife and children live in Burlington, Ontario, just a couple miles up from uh, north of the border, north of New York State. Um, and, and it's so corrosive, that kind of tactic, because it sends a message to the rest of the uh, community in Canada if they dare to speak up, if they dare to stand up, uh, they may be arrested abroad and, and taken to the PRC. Yeah, well, I, um, I again, I, uh, and I think we need to do a better job of coordinating with other like-minded countries that when another country has somebody who is uh, seeking asylum um, and uh, yet China has a particular hold over uh, the country where that person may be uh, seeking refuge and are thinking of deporting him or her back to China, I mean, we ought to, we ought to be more coordinated in our, in our efforts to try to provide a circle a protection around those individuals, but I, I, I um, you know, I, I, this is an important topic, uh, and the, but the, 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 the abuse of these various platforms to target people, to discredit people, uh, to spread conspiracy theories, I mean, is is, is proliferated in a way that I don't think any of us could have imagined when social media first came into being. And I mean, it's hard to figure out how to put the genie back in the bottle. But we need, we we need, and and maybe the maybe the counteroffensive that we're you know are more truth tellers, um, trying to influence on social media, um, and um, you know, and we need to, you know, maybe we, maybe we need to try to establish uh, a group of people to to set the record straight. But uh, again, I I just thought it was interesting when I Google uh, you know Maui fires. I, when I, when I, put it, I plugged it in on Twitter, you know, two conspiracy uh, theories appear, uh, both that are being peddled by the Chinese government. But I appreciate your, your courage and I appreciate your advocacy and I look forward to working with you in the, in the months ahead. I yield back. Commissioner Zinke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for being here. It's not easy to stand up for freedom and it takes a lot of courage and thanks. Um, I'd like to ask your thoughts on Chinese capabilities and priorities, perhaps, on industrial espionage, uh, in particular uh, the high-tech uh, sector. Well, thank you, uh, Representative Sinke, for that uh, question. It's a, it's a very um, serious area of foreign interference. Our security services have told us that uh, the PRC is a threat in two ways in five areas. Uh, they are a threat uh, to our national security, uh, and they're a threat to, the, to us in the form of the theft of intellectual property. Um, and that is in particular in five sensitive areas of research and development at our leading universities and in our leading uh, Canadian companies. And those five areas are uh, telecommunications, 5G telecommunications, uh, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, biopharma, and clean technologies. Um, and so I think what we should be doing is banning any uh, government funding of research in partnership with PRC entities in those five sensitive areas of research. And so whether it's the, you know, the four Canadian granting councils or, you know, in the United States here, the National Institutes of Health and other uh, granting councils, I think we need to make it clear that we won't fund research in those five areas. That's in partnership with PRC entities. I think we also need to ban research in partnership uh, with any uh, entity affiliated with the People's Liberation Army. And l let me follow up. Uh, a concern when you talk about green technologies is EV. It sounds so nice. And I am all for cleaner is better, et cetera. Um, but I'm concerned about the supply chain because when, in order to power EV, it takes batteries. And just a cursory look at the supply chain, uh, when you look at what is required for a battery, well, lithium, cobalt. So who controls the mining of lithium, cobalt, and those other materials? And then the chips, who's making the chips that runs it, and the production. And it goes on and on. And then, of course, the other side of it is, what do you do when the battery is ended its life cycle? You know, in the U.S., 90% of the solar cells that 
are no longer useful because of the technology and different reasons. They're just thrown into a landfill someplace across the country. Uh, we have no plan on what to disposal of the toxic batteries and, and liability. So I, I'm concerned on the EV world uh, on that because it seems like we're pushing an agenda without looking at the engine behind it, and the engine seems to be Chinese. Uh, do you share that same concern? Yes, I share that concern. I think there's two ways in which Canada can be a stronger partner to the United States in that regard. I think, first off, we are a vast country with immense natural resources. We have critical minerals of our own that uh, can be part of the North American automobile supply chain, and I think that's an area in which we can work more closely with the United States. I think the second area, though, is equally important. We're the fifth largest natural gas producer in the world, and we currently don't have an LNG export facility to get our natural gas to global markets. And if we can get those terminals built, if we can export natural gas to international markets and nat more natural gas to the United States, we can accomplish two goals. First, we can help reduce global emissions because a fifth of global emissions come from coal-fired electricity plants in places like the People's Republic of China. Uh, we can cut those emissions in half overnight by transitioning those plants to natural gas. And secondly, we can help displace authoritarian uh, gas from oil and gas from authoritarian states and replace it with oil and gas produced here uh, from democracies. And I think particularly when it comes to Germany and Japan, which are currently buying vast amounts of uh, gas from authoritarian states, that you know, it should, they should be buying their gas from Canada instead and from the United States. And so those are two ways in which I think we can help the United States. We've got critical mineral, minerals of our own, and we've got vast amounts of natural gas that we need to get to international markets. It seems like on both sides we have hurdles for our national gas uh, exports. But you're actually right. I mean, no one does it cleaner better than, than North America. And if you want to look at you know, how not to produce energy, I'll take you on a tour of Russia or the Middle East. Uh, the, the other point I, I think is important, you, you look at dependency uh, and who is dependent on who and for what. Uh, on critical minerals that you mentioned, uh, a look at it is there are some critical minerals that they have the entirety of the supply chain. And it's not a secret, well, one of them happens to be germanium. And it turns out germanium is needed for lenses, especially high-definition lenses that you might want to put on military hardware, thermal optics. Matter of fact, almost everything we use. But when, when critical minerals are locked up and we can't get to the resources, we have germanium here. But the germanium permit is almost impossible to get and while technology in the battlefield changes every two years, we, we're waiting 25 years for a permit. And I, and I, would, ag I would agree, absolutely, the trans -canal, trans the, the pipeline, uh, which is about 18 inches, uh, would both reduce overall emissions and, and help us shore up our energy needs, natural gas pipelines. Do you see any success in your current government on, on, the, on this issue? Well, I think you're, you're exactly right. Uh, we need regulatory reform in Canada uh, to reduce the regulatory hurdles to approving natural resource projects. In fact, the government of Canada itself has acknowledged that. Uh, Minister, Finance Minister Freeland was actually here in Washington last year and said that Canada needs to expedite the approval of these natural resource projects to get our projects to uh, resources to market to help our allies. He was very explicit about that. Um, I'm, I await the Canadian government's uh, plans in that regard. It can be done. Um, I'll give you one example of how a democracy did it. Uh, Germany, after the war in Ukraine began, realized that it had a complete reliance on Russian natural gas and that those pipelines were being shut down. We know one of them was blown up in the Baltic Sea and the other one uh, never came online. And so Germany had to scramble. Well, within uh, Within days after last February's invasion, they approved six new LNG terminals in the Baltic and North Sea. One of them came online in a record uh, roughly six months uh, from approval to live operation in Willemshaven, which is a port, I believe, in the North Sea. 
Um, so democracies like Canada can expedite these projects. We just need the political will to do so, and I think it's critical that we do that. I look forward to working with that. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Ms. Salinas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Chong, we've been talking a little bit about science and technology, and I actually serve on the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, where we frequently discuss issues around research security, especially in the context of economic competition with China. International research collaboration does have significant benefits, but reports suggest that our efforts to crack down on bad actors have actually caused many Chinese-American researchers to leave positions at American universities, and I understand this. How can we balance protecting against real, legitimate, and dangerous threats from the Chinese government and their influence on college campuses and fostering a welcoming environment for students and researchers at North American universities where we really want to make true advancements? Well, that's a great question. You know, we have to balance academic freedom uh, with the need to protect national security in sensitive areas of research. And I think what's criti one critical element in doing that is being open and transparent about what research will be funded and what won't be funded. Um, and I think that will clear the suspicion. I think in the absence of clear policies about what the government will fund, um, and what it won't fund because it, across, it crosses a line, I think you clear a lot of the suspicion away. Um, and so my view is in the Canadian context, we should be clear that uh, we will not fund uh, research partnerships and research that is done in collaboration with PRC entities in the five sensitive areas of research that I identified, and secondly, in research partnerships uh, with the People's Liberation Army. I don't think there's any research that the Canadian government should fund that's done in collaboration uh, with the PRC's military. Um, and so if we put those policies in place and also then simply advise universities that we think that there are security risks, if you on your own decide to fund those research partnerships, if you decide uh, to do those uh, partnerships in those five sensitive areas, then I, think, then I think we empower uh, our university community, our academics, to do the right thing, and I'm confident that they will, and that they'll, they'll know where the lines are, and I think that clears a lot of the suspicion about any research that, that's being conducted um, with uh, researchers from the PRC. Xiangchu, 第一步,点击右上角最左边的机器人符号开始对话,向图片中红框中的那样。第二步,如图选择六度万事,我们未来将推出更多的AI供大家选择。然后,就可以与六博士悄悄畅谈了。还支持论坛内部信息搜索哦
fighting corruption, defending human rights. These must be at the core of our agenda as we engage in the global stage. Mr. Campbell, if confirmed, I hope you will work to make sure that these values are front and center. I have enormous respect for the work of our diplomats and civil servants that they do every day. We must make sure the Department has the support and resources it needs to advance U.S. interests and keep crisis from expanding. Food insecurity, severe natural disasters, and extreme heat make worse by climate crisis multiply the threats facing the globe. Humanitarian crises have devastated Haiti, Burma, Syria, Yemen, and Sudan. In Africa, there have been seven coups in the Sahel and West Africa in the past three years, in addition to coups in Sudan and Gambam. Instability now stretches across the continent from the Red Sea to the Atlantic. In our hemisphere, illicit fent fentanyl trafficking and irregular migration affect cities and communities in nearly every state in America. The demise of democratic governance and widespread human rights abuses in Venezuela and Haiti require increased attention. At the same time, the United States must not only respond to global crises, but must lead with a proactive agenda. Whether it is nurturing our alliance with our NATO and G7 partners, promoting an agenda for economic growth, advancing solutions to climate change, or improving global health, the Department of State must be operating at full capacity to tackle these challenges. That means keeping morale up while upholding the traditions of providing space for constructive dissent within the department. It means fully staffing our mission in Africa and making sure ambassadorial nominees have the relevant regional experience to lead effectively. It means being ambitious and consistent with our resourcing. It means making sure the department makes notable progress on diversity, equity, and inclusion from every bureau to every post. It means getting our diplomats and civil servants the training and skills to address climate, global health, cyber, economics, and the 21st century security challenges. Mr. Campbell, there is no shortage of challenges awaiting you in this post. So I want to thank you for your willingness to serve. I want to thank your family for supporting you in this challenge. And I look forward to hearing your plans for carrying out this role, if confirmed, and helping lead the department to confront the challenges ahead. With that, I yield to the distinguished ranking member, Senator Risch. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman uh, and uh, Dr. Campbell. Glad to have you here today, and thanks for uh, being willing to do this job. Over the past uh, last few years, the geostrategic landscape has shifted, and the United States has lacked the policies necessary to respond to the emerging threats and challenges. We need strong leadership that addresses these global challenges rather than focus on promoting policies that appeal to certain domestic audiences. Between Russia's ongoing invasion of Ukraine, China's bid to dominate the Indo-Pacific, and exert malign influence and efforts to undermine the very existence of our close ally Israel, the threats to the U.S. interests and our credibility are dangerously high. I've been particularly concerned by state's lack of focus on China, its disorganized efforts to stand up uh, new embassies in the Pacific, and lack of a robust support to our allies in the region. With almost 30 years of experience in Indo-Pacific, I want to hear from you how you plan to address our greatest challenge, China. I believe the President's current policy is headed in the wrong direction. The administration assures us it is not falling into the traps of the past, but the economic relationships cannot stabilize all of U.S.-China relations. Meanwhile, China continues to expand its influence throughout the global south, including uh, in our own hemisphere. The recent focus at the APEC summit on establishing working groups with China allows them to weaponize against us. Beijing wants, us to tie, Beijing wants to tie us up in these mechanisms and use them to constrain our policies, as we've seen time and time again. On the military-to-military -military front, the administration claims, and maybe even believes, talks will help avoid miscalculation. If we were dealing uh, with a good-faith actor, that should be true. But we aren't. Just days after China agreed to these talks, and everybody happily shook hands, it conducted aggressive acts at sea and in air, risking the lives of U.S. Uh, and allied sailors. Uh, this, uh, this effort is off to a bad start, and I'm uh, concerned that they had no, uh, they have, China has uh, uh, no interest in uh, doing what should be done. 
Treatment of U.S. diplomats in China should be another warning sign. During COVID, China exposed U.S. personnel and their families to extreme, unsafe, and degrading testing and treatment protocols, and senior department leadership allowed such treatment to persist. That's unacceptable. I want your commitment that you will work with other department leaders to investigate what happened and pursue accountability. Uh, and after the most recent climate summit, I'm worried the department will now support Chinese uh, cooperation, so-called cooperation on climate, at the sub-national level. This is really dangerous. The administration is giving China a legitimate entry point to peddle its influence in U.S. cities in ways that undermine our national policy. Why would the department support Chinese efforts to undermine our system of governance? While, you're, uh, while you are an Asia expert, you must also provide leadership on other policy matters in the world. In Europe, uh, we need to maintain support for Ukraine while ensuring proper and strict oversight of taxpayer dollars. We've been doing that, but vigilance is, is, uh, is most important. Ukraine is fully capable of achieving victory, but until the administration gets over its fear of giving them what they need to win, its future and that of Europe will remain at risk. U.S. credibility among our allies in Asia is dependent on our success in Europe. Secretary Blinken's comments about China playing a role in peace discussions in Ukraine are very troubling. China must not and should not be allowed to, to use Ukraine as a way to anchor itself in European security issues because of some misguided belief that it can calm Russia down. The United States also needs to ensure there is a well-thought-out plan for Ukraine's reconstruction and supports its path to self-sufficiency and protects, it, it protects its ec economy from foreign influence. I support the Secretary's comment in October, stating that the U.S. needs legal authorities to seize sovereign, southern, sovereign Russian assets in the U.S. for Ukraine reconstruction. My bill, the partisan, uh, bipartisan, bicameral Repo Act, will provide these authorities. I hope to work with you and with the Chairman to get this bill passed quickly and get these authorities in place. In the Middle East, the Hamas attacks against Israel and Iran's uh, undeterred attacks against our troops are a clear signal that this administration's Iran policy continues to fail. The administration's fruitless nuclear negotiations, unfreezing of funds, weak oil sanctions enforcement, and failure to maintain regional det deterrence have uh, emboldened Iran and Iran's terror proxies. U.S. credibility is weakened. It is a time for the U.S. to dramatically change course and firmly respond to restore deterrence. We must return to a policy of economic isolation for Iran and deny the regime uh, resources to support regional terrorism, especially Chinese uh, purchases of Iranian oil. I have been deeply troubled by the efforts by the administration to, to provide billions of dollars of fresh cash uh, to the Iranians. I look forward to hearing your thoughts on all of these important issues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Risch. Uh, our guest today is the is Kirk Campbell, who is the president's nominee for Deputy Secretary of State. Kirk Campbell currently serves as Deputy Assistant to the President and Coordinator for the Indo-Pacific Affairs at, on the National Security Council. From 2009 to 2013, Mr. Campbell served as the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific Affairs. Earlier, he was CEO and co-founder of the Center for New American Security and concurrently served as the director of the Aspen Strategy Group and chairman of the editorial board of the Washington Quarterly. Among the other positions he's held during his distinguished career, Mr. Campbell uh, served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asia and Pacific Affairs, he served both Defense and State Department in similar roles. White House Fellow at the Treasury Department and as Director of the Democracy Office at the National Security Council during the Clinton Administration. Mr. Campbell was an Assistant Associate Professor of Public Policy at the Harvard John F. Kennedy School of Government and served in the U.S. Navy Reserves. Once again, we thank you for your willingness to serve. Your entire statement will be made part of the record. We'd ask that you try to summarize your record in about five minutes so we can have a dialogue with the members of the committee. That's great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Cardin, uh, Ranking Minority Rish. I appreciate your comments. I took careful note. Uh, I would submit my full uh, uh, 
statement for the record today. I, I do want to just begin with a few thank yous, if I might. Um, during this process, some of this was new to me. I had a chance to spend quite a bit of time with the committees, uh, both the majority and minority committee. I want to thank Damian Murphy. I want to thank Chris Socha. Not only were these important for me, I actually learned a lot. I found it incredibly valuable to hear their perspectives. I do want to promise not only will I commit to work closely with you, but I'm going to work closely with the committees. I know their role. I know what they've done, and I appreciated the time they've taken with me over the course of the last couple of weeks. I also just want to say you have to say thank you to folks who helped you get here. The number of hours that people behind me spent supporting me is incredible. I just want to say thanks to Nas and to Roy, our two wonderful colleagues at the State Department who helped me with this, and also on my team at the White House, Pat Shiloh, Hannah Suh, and Nick DeParle, all of whom put enormous efforts in trying to make me prepared for today, and that's no small task. Before you start your testimony, um, I know two of our colleagues wanted to give some introductory remarks. Sure, thank First, you. let me recognize Senator Duckworth. Mr. Chairman, thank you for this opportunity to introduce Dr. Kurt Campbell, President Biden's nominee to serve as Deputy Secretary of State. In the words of Secretary Blinken, Kurt, and I quote, Kurt is one of our nation's leading diplomats and strategists, a visionary policymaker, and a renowned leader whose nomination comes at a critical inflection point for our world and America's role in it. Kurt is no stranger to public service. For the past two years, he has served as senior advisor to the president and coordinator for Indo-Pacific Affairs at the National Security Council and as Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian Affairs in the Obama-Biden administration, he focused America's strategic attention and investment towards the Indo-Pacific, a region increasingly vital for our national security and prosperity. I am here today introducing him because I have full confidence in his ability to steer the Department of State through a time of significant global challenges and opportunities with creativity, commitment, and dedication to serving our country and one of its most important institutions. In his, curtain role, in his current role, Kurt has had the pleasure, and I'm sure he would describe it that way in his most gracious and diplomatic uh, terms, of hearing my many opinions and ideas. In our numerous conversations, I have been frank in my assessment of our policy in the Indo-Pacific, like when I've told him that the United States had neglected too many Southeast Asian partnerships that should be among our closest. He has listened, even when my feedback has been critical. He has been open to learn and try new things, and he has been creative in his problem solving. And more than that, he's brought energy to his role in the NSC with incredibly impactful actions, from AUKUS to our enhanced relationships with the Pacific Islands, making grueling uh, multi-day journeys to only to be on the ground for a few hours in far-flung uh, island hopping locations that produce immediate results for our national security. That makes a real lasting difference for the security of our nation. Dr. Campbell has had deep experience outside of government as well. He has served as CEO and co-founder of the Center for a New American Security, as has already been mentioned, director of the Aspen Strategy Group, chairman of the editorial board of the Washington Quarterly, in addition to his time as founding chairman and chief executive officer of the Asia Group. Somehow, on top of all of this, he has found time to author or edit 10 books. All I can say is he must have an enormously patient family uh, putting up with his schedule. And I th want to thank his family uh, uh, um, who are here today for, for their service to our nation as well. And finally, Kurt is a veteran of the United States Navy. Uh, I couldn't be more proud as a fellow vet uh, to have him uh, uh, and his service to our government. I am confident that Dr. Campbell will bring these myriad experiences to bear as Deputy Secretary of State, along with his many relationships, formidable intellect, and considerably, considerable drive, all for the good of the department and our nation. I look forward to supporting his nomination, which comes at a critical time and could not be more well-deserved and much needed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Haggerty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I believe that the chairman and ranking member did an excellent job of conveying the many challenges that confront us from a diplomatic standpoint as a nation. And it's for that reason I couldn't be more pleased than to see Dr. Campbell sitting at this chair as our nominee for this critical post. Dr. Campbell is someone that I've known for more than 30 years. We are uh, both alumni of a program called White House Fellowship, as is his lovely wife, Lael. Obviously, that program has had an incredible impact on their lives and careers, as it has on mine, and it's been a, a great 
benefit for me to have had the opportunity to see Kurt's career evolve over the past 30 years' time. We both have a shared interest and love for the Indo-Pacific region. When I served as U.S. Ambassador to Japan, I called on Kurt many times. I found our conversations when I was in that role to be most helpful, most insightful. And again, I'm delighted to see Kurt here in this position because the Indo-Pacific region is going to play a critical role in our world's future. It's home to 60% of the world's population, 50% of the world's GDP. And having someone with Kurt's unique insight and capability and expertise in that region, I think is going to prove invaluable to us. Something even more important, though, are his character traits and skills. Kurt has a military background, as, as Senator Duckworth mentioned. Uh, his leadership skills are going to be critical, taking the managerial and operational challenges that he has, uh, running a 70,000-person operation scattered all ends of the planet. So I'm pleased to see someone with your background, Kurt, who has real experience in the State Department, real experience at the National Security Council, in the Department of Defense, and in the private sector. Uh, you also have demonstrated your diplomatic skills here today by having two members of this committee introduce you. My hat's off. It's the first time I've seen that. My hat's off to you there. Uh, I'm looking forward to your readiness on day one to be able to do this job. And I think my colleagues will see during the course of this hearing that we have a very competent and qualified person today. Thank you. Oh, well, I thank Senator Duckworth and Senator Haggerty for their introductions. Uh, Dr. Campbell, you now may proceed. You've you got an extra minute of time because we're going to start to clock over again in five minutes. Thank you. I always <laughs> like that extra minute. Uh, thanks to both senators. That was very gracious and much appreciated. Um, so I, I really said thank you to our teams. I, I need to say a word of thanks to my wife, uh, Lel Brader, and my wonderful daughter, Coco Campbell. Coco is a sophomore in high school and is missing a test today, so she's pretending like it's a big hardship, but she's actually pretty happy to be here. Uh, my wife was in this chair not long ago uh, as she was being confirmed for vice chairman of the Federal Reserve. I was back there. At that time, I actually thought that was the hardest chair. I was incredibly nervous and anxious, but it's actually harder sitting here, so I'm here. Anyway, I want to thank them both. They're patient. They're wonderful. I have the best wife in the world. I admire her enormously. Um, so let me just say a few things as we get started. It's not lost on me the day that we're meeting. This is uh, December 7th, day that will forever live in infamy, and it is a reminder of uh, things that we must keep in mind critically uh, in foreign policy and diplomacy. One is, the, is to be constantly vigilant about the potential for strategic surprise. Um, I, I think it would be fair to say that the United States is exerting itself intensively uh, in the Middle East and Ukraine. I believe those pursuits are necessary. Uh, they're critically important. But it is also the case, I also believe, that fundamentally our long-term interests over the remainder of this century will play out largely in the Indo-Pacific, and there is the real risk of strategic surprise. And there are countries that are testing us, looking to see if we're preoccupied. And I want to just commit to you today, if confirmed, uh, I will do everything possible working within the United States government to make sure that we are not tested and that we stand ready to respond to any challenges uh, to our power, uh, to uh, our allies in the Indo-Pacific more directly. But I will also say December 7th teaches us other things as well, um, and that is the redemptive power of democracy. So Senator Haggerty talked about uh, uh, the Indo-Pacific. We also share a deep love of Japan. I would contend with you that our most important ally and partner on the global stage today might be Japan. We've done a remarkable amount of things from the rubble of that. That's got to give us hope as we persevere in a variety of places around the globe. I would simply say that the thing I'm proudest of over the last several years is working with partners on this committee and elsewhere, building uh, resolute, innovative partnerships in the Pacific. I'm sure we're going to talk about AUKUS. I'm very proud of AUKUS. I'm proud of taking the Quad to the leader level, bringing the, uh, the maritime democracies of Asia together. I'm proud of helping forge a stronger partnership between Japan and South Korea after decades of difficulty and challenge. I'm proud of the work I did in Vietnam, in India, countries that strategically are more aligned with us, 
difficult, undeniably, but critically important. I'm also proud of the fact that some of the countries that are the strongest supporters of the United States in Europe today are from the Indo-Pacific. Japan, South Korea, Australia, others have stood with us to support uh, Ukraine in its difficult time. So I just want to underscore that uh, I think one of the reasons uh, I was asked to take on these responsibilities is to remind all of us of the importance of the Indo-Pacific more directly. Last couple of things, and I'll just conclude. Uh, I, I honestly, uh, I approach this with today and just in general with enormous humility. You've noted, uh, Senator Rich, this is not a job just about the Indo-Pacific. There's an enormous uh, canvas, a massive undertaking at the State Department. I think all of you have worked on the State Department's details, have authored its programs. So in many respects, I have just an enormous amount to learn. I will commit to you, I'll be as honest and straightforward as I possibly can today and in the future. But if I, know, if I don't know something, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to get back to you. And so I'll do my best to answer your questions today, and I look forward to that conversation. And then just lastly, I, I will say, uh, if confirmed, I'm going to work closely with the committee and also uh, with the staff. And the reason that I can say this with high confidence is I've already done this. I've spent an enormous amount of time with people on the Hill and on both sides of the aisle. Our best foreign policy initiatives are bipartisan, and they match the resolve of the executive and legislative branches. I've committed my career to those goals, and if I'm committed for this job, I promise to take that forward. Over to you, Senator. Thank you. Look at that. Right at <laughs> Well done. Thank you very much for your comments. We're going to start at five-minute rounds. Uh, let me just point out to the members of our committee that uh, this committee reported out the August, uh, both Pillar 1 and 2. Uh, they are now included in the National Defense Authorization Act, so we're very optimistic that we're going to be moving forward with the response that we needed to do to make sure we move forward with the agreements between Australia and UK. We have questions that we asked. Um, that we asked you to respond either yes or no to for the committee. Uh, do you agree to appear before this committee and make official from your office available to the committee and designated staff when invited? Yes, absolutely. Do you commit to keep this committee fully and currently informed about the activities under your purview? Yes. Do you commit to engaging in meaningful consultation while policies are being developed, not just providing notification after the fact? Yes. Do you commit to promptly responding to requests for briefings and information requested by the committee and its designated staff? Yes, I do, Senator. Four for four. That was a good start. Yeah. Uh, now we'll start the five-minute round. So let me ask you, uh, I want to ask you one question about the normalization talks between Israel and its neighbors. I uh, joined a group of 10 senators that visited the Middle East shortly after Hamas's horrific attacks on October 7th. We were there to show our support for Israel, but we stopped at Saudi Arabia to try to keep on track the normalization conversations that were taking place between the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Israel and the United States. Uh, since that time and during that time, it became very clear to us that one of Hamas's goals in its attack against Israel was to derail the normalization talks between Israel and its neighbors. So my question to you, if confirmed, how will you work to make sure that those talks are kept on track and not derailed as a result of the conflict that's taking place in the Middle East? Well, thank you, Chairman. Let me just say that um, I think the initiatives that began in the Trump administration to help bridge the diplomatic isolation that Israel has experienced are very important, and I think the Biden administration has sought to build on those. And you rightly point out that we were at a very delicate stage in our diplomacy between Israel uh, and Saudi Arabia and other countries as well, and also looking at linking up uh, various uh, industrial energy and transportation lines uh, with um, uh, India and other countries. Um, the October 7 attacks have been devastating, and obviously the region is now engulfed in anxiety associated with the ongoing conflict. I will say that I think we can be uh, carefully encouraged by some of the discussions that we've had to date that indicate that there still is a willingness among the key players 
to uh, restart this process and continue it. And I believe that ultimately our goal will be to entrench Israel diplomatically in the region. I believe that is in our best interests. I also believe it is in the best interests of the countries that we work with closely uh, in the Gulf, including Saudi Arabia. Uh, I think it is understandable that at this moment some of those discussions are quiet and they are difficult, uh, Chairman, but I believe that we must keep that dialogue going and also work towards a situation in which once this terrible conflict is resolved that we can work with those partners to try to reassemble uh, uh, Middle East at peace and with uh, more stable structures. I, uh, in my opening statement uh, and in our private conversations, I told you about my priorities to make sure that we conduct our foreign policy based upon our values. Uh, and that's what President Biden has said. Uh, diversity, equity, inclusion is part of our values. Uh, the department has a strategic plan, an equity action plan in regards to diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's part of our values that we promote for other countries to do. And yet, when we look at the recruitment and retention at the State Department, it has not always been the showcase of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So do we have your commitment as to how you will embrace the need for our State Department to not only espouse these values globally, but to demonstrate through its own internal actions? Um, you do, Senator, and I would just go beyond that as well. I know you and others have been involved in conversations and how best to think about modernizing and helping make sure that the State Department is able to meet the modern challenges of diplomacy, how to improve retention, how to work with recruitment, how to make sure that our diplomatic core reflects not only our values but our diversity. Um, I just want to commit to you that I know that that legislation is still in the process of uh, internal discussion. I will commit to you to work with that. I do believe that these efforts uh, are important and it's critical that the State Department keep up with modern matters of innovation bureaucratically, strategically, given the challenges that we're facing. And my last question deals with Iran. Iran is helping Russia in its war against Ukraine. Iran is the facilitator for the terrorist operations in the Middle East, including Hamas and its attack against Israel, the, the Hezbollah, the Houthis, the militias in Syria and Iraq. How do you see Iran's threat against America's national security? And what steps do you think we need to take? Look, Senator, I, I think I join with all of you is that I'm quite concerned by a wide array uh, of Iranian, Iranian activities. We've seen provocative support to uh, groups around the Middle East. I've been uh, very personally concerned by Iranian support for Russia in Ukraine. Uh, I think, as we heard from Senator Risch, they are increasingly aligning themselves, aligning themselves with China more directly. I think at probably every level, Iran is uh, our strategic nemesis. Uh, they are uh, seeking to undermine American purpose in the region, and we must contest that purposely across the board. Senator Risch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to ask you, I, I don't usually do this, but I'm going to read you some questions that I'd like a direct yes or no answer to. And then I've got, uh, I'll give you a chance on when we get uh, some other questions to, to talk a little bit about. First of all, uh, one of the things... Uh, I want to ask you on the record, will you pledge to provide direct oversight of the Department of State's implementation of AUKUS? Absolutely, yes. Uh, will you commit to pursuing a thorough investigation into the decisions made by the State Department from uh, 2020 onwards that enabled China to subject U.S. diplomats to violations uh, of their privileges and immunities? Senator Rich, I will, and I must thank you. I've read the letters that you've sent carefully, and I uh, fully intend to do so. I appreciate that. Uh, will you work to remove barriers to U.S. agencies supporting natural gas over Chinese coal? Uh, I believe natural gas plays a critical role as a transitional fuel. I've worked closely with this committee and others to ensure that that is the case, particularly in the Indo-Pacific. Yes. Thank you. 
Uh, will you agree to providing this committee with a fulsome and detailed explanation of why the Biden administration did not repudiate Hong Kong Chief Executive John Lee's claim of being invited to APEC? Uh, I can give you more background on that now, if, if that would be useful, uh, Senator. Well, why don't you do that as a question for the record? Could you That's do that great. For me? I'll, I'll be happy That'll to do give that. me a chance. But to... I, I do want to underscore very clearly here, uh, uh, we made clear to both China and Hong Kong authorities uh, that he would not be welcome uh, in San Francisco, and indeed he would need to be sending a second, which he did. So I, I do want to underscore that that we never intended for him to participate right. in the APEC. And I appreciate your uh, yeah. public dec uh, declaration yeah. of that right here. Um, and this one I'm going to uh, not necessarily give you a yes or no. You, you can talk about it, and that is uh, – uh, given China's ongoing support for Russia uh, in its war against Ukraine, what are your thoughts as we get to the end, and there will be an end, of uh, discussions uh, regarding ending the war and then uh, on rebuilding Ukraine? And I'll give you a, a, a spoiler alert here. I don't think China ought to have any fingerprints on this yeah. whatsoever, but I appreciate hearing your thoughts on yeah. it. Look, um Senator Rush, I have to say, in my discussions with your team, uh, which were extensive, uh, we had very uh, clear discussions around this issue, and I will tell you that they represented your views clearly and un unmistakably. And I don't want to say that they schooled me, but I really came away uh, with a much deeper appreciation and I think a greater sense of what the limitations are for any kind of role that China can or would play in the future. So I just want to make clear about that. I will say personally I'm quite troubled by China's uh, support for Russia in its war in Ukraine. I think we can see over the course of the last year and a half or so, China has assisted through a variety of means, not necessarily direct military means, but through you know, support through commercial and other engagements, but Russia has largely reconstituted militarily. And even though China uh, purports to be a uh, independent actor that has not taken sides, very clearly they have taken sides here. And that is deeply concerning to me. So one of the reasons why, and there are many reasons why we have to be so committed uh, uh, to Ukraine is that authoritarians take lessons from other authoritarian experiences. And I will tell you one of the reasons why countries in the Indo-Pacific are so determined to support Ukraine is because they don't want the same thing to happen in the Indo-Pacific. So we, we have to be vigilant here because this is not just about the future of Europe, which in and itself is an enormous and important concern in the United States. We have to be concerned of what lessons that China would take from us if it went badly. Well, I appreciate that. I think that's uh, well said. I, I don't think there's any question that China will try to leverage uh, some way into into this, uh, trying to uh, bootstrap themselves somehow in Europe. And uh, so yeah. I, I think we need to be vigilant in that regard. Well, my time's almost up, but I do. I know you're on the National Security Council and get to hear about the discussions. Uh, uh, what in the world is the administration thinking about <laughs> freeing up cash to Iran. I mean, I was aghast when you started, when, when the administration was started with the first six billion, and then even worse than that, after the fighting started in Israel, they're talking about the other 10 billion. So help, help me understand this. I just, I, I can't, I just can't square that circle. I really can't. Yeah. Well, look, Senator, I, I, I do want to just underscore a, a few things. I, I tried to lay out clearly what at least my view, and I think the view of uh, the administration is on Iran's role. I, I do want to underscore, underscore one thing that despite some discussions in the media and elsewhere, I, I don't think anyone sees that there's any chance in the current environment to go back to the JCPOA. It's just not on the table. It's not up for discussion. So just I, I hope that at least provides you some assurance more. I, I think that's Pretty straightforward. I, I agree, but it's still important to state on the, luck, uh, on the record. So I, I will also say that the administration has not lifted any sanctions on Iran. And overall, I think the beginning of the administration, the number is about 400 that have been applied. I, I, 
I recognize the concerns on the six billion, and I could. You, you've heard all the arguments more generally. The money has not been spent; it's still in an account. We have absolutely full confidence that if money were taken out of that, it would be used specifically for the needs of the Iranian people and for humanitarian concerns. But I do want to just underscore, um, Senator, I think we're in an environment right now where Iran is uh, taking a role that is so antithetical to our interests that we must be even more vigilant. We must be sending a military message that provocations will be uh, met and, and met with stern responses. We must I isolate them diplomatically, internationally. And I just want to commit to you, I, I do think this is a subject that we need to have close consultations on. And we've got to work with you, not just at the end of policy deliberations, but as the Senator said, Chairman said, earlier in the process. So I think we share many of the strategic assessments of Iran going forward and managing this delicate period given the conflict uh, in Gaza between Israel uh, uh, and, and Hamas is going to be critical. Thank you for that answer. Thank Senator you. Menendez. Uh, thank you. Mr. Campbell, uh, I haven't had the pleasure of working with you, uh, so I don't know uh, your views as deeply and is that in, in, since your position that you're nominated for is global in nature. I have a series of questions I want to pursue to get an understanding of where you're, where you're coming from in that regard. Um, for the first time in history, the Republican majority in the House passed a bill conditioning aid to Israel. At the same time, uh, I've been sensing contradictory messages from the White House as to whether or not President Biden is considering or would consider placing conditions on aid to Israel. Uh, what is uh, your view? Uh, on creating conditions on aid to Israel? Well, look, Senator Mendez, I think you know this, that, that all aid at some level is conditioned. We don't just send money out the door. We go through a careful process, both at the State Department and the interagency. So I just want to just begin that. I'm not talking about the I, normal I know you're not. conditions. I, yeah. I, I know you're not. Um, but. I, I, my own personal view is, and I believe that this, this is the view of the president and the administration, is that we are standing side by side with Israel in an absolutely desperate fight, that they're facing enormous challenges, the worst attack, terrorist attack in their history, largest lo loss of life. Um, I, I do believe that we have been careful uh, publicly and very clear privately about some of our concerns about the conduct of the military operation. And we want to make clear that there is a difference between Hamas fighters and Palestinian civilians also, and particularly uh, children and women. And those conversations are ongoing. Uh, that's what you do with close allies and partners. You speak directly to them. I, their I, get, I get the conversations and I agree with them. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that's... But the question is... Uh, is creating conditionality a way to achieve that goal or to hamstring? I mean, look, I'm for our military telling Israel how it meets the challenge of Hamas in an urban setting. I'm not sure that the standards that we seek of Israel were met in Afghanistan and Iraq by the United States. So the question in my mind is, is it, you're going to be sitting in a position not only of authority but of advice. Is, would it be your advice to create conditionality on aid to Israel at this time? It would not be at this okay. time. Thank Let you. me ask you this. With reference to Iran, I was heartened to hear some of the things you said. You called it a strategic nemesis. Would you consider Iran an enemy of the United States? I, I think they're uh, an antagonist, Senator, yes. Well, yeah. So here's a country that continues to violate its obligations under the JCPOA that other countries yeah. still maintained with, that is not forthcoming with the IAEA about their enrichment uh, uh, operations, where we, I don't think we clearly know what they have and don't have, don't come clean with their past uh, pursuit of nuclear weapons. Here's a country that is giving uh, Russia drones uh, in Ukraine. Here's a country through its proxies that is uh, trying to strike at our troops in Iraq and Syria. I don't, I don't know how much more it comes before one says, yeah, that's an enemy of the United States. Uh, and so is it time to seek to internationalize the sanctions that we've had? Because we've had sanctions, but of course, 
internationalizing sanctions are the way in which we ultimately achieve greater results. Uh, Senator, I, I can't disagree with anything that you've said here, and I think if confirmed, um, frankly, I would uh, welcome the opportunity to have greater discussions on this, both with you and the team at the State Department. I do want to underscore that we are contesting them um, significantly. You saw the statement that Secretary Austin made the day before yesterday that, yes, some of their um, uh, associated groups do occasionally attack us or try to many times ineffectively, but when we strike back at them, we always hit our target. I just want to say that I think the administration remains absolutely resolute that we will uh, persecute our interests. We will take necessary military. I appreciate the, the tit for tat, but I, I, I believe a stronger message has to be sent. Let me ask you, do you believe that we should be selling F-16s to Turkey when it continues to not allow Sweden uh, to move forward in its accession to uh, NATO, when it continues uh, to threaten its neighbor, the Hellenic Republic, uh, when it continues to jail uh, lawyers and journalists and human rights activists uh, in a long list uh, of issues yeah. that it faces? Is, is that in the national interest and security of the United States? So, look, I think you point out the complexities of our re relationship with Turkey, and there are some real concerns here. I, I can't get into the details. I'm not specifically briefed about where things stand, particularly uh, Senator on the F-16, but I will, uh, if I'm confirmed, be involved in those decisions. I will say that um, they are involved in many things that concern us, um, and I'm confident that we will, over time, uh, admit Finland into NATO despite some of the challenges that we've had procedurally. I will also say there is a modest balance here. There are things that Turkey has assisted us with. Um, they have assisted us in the counter ISIS campaign. They have uh, they've uh, helped us in the food, the, the transshipment of grain uh, through the Black Sea. They have done some things that have been in our interests. And so we have but to... In the weight of it, I would just suggest to you that uh, those few things far uh, don't, don't outweigh the, the various uh, elements of which there are negativity. I have a series of other questions. Obviously, I don't have the time for them. Thank I'm going to submit them for the record. I'd Thank really you. like a responsive uh, answer so that um, I can decide on uh, your nomination. Thank you. Thank you very much. Senator Romney. Mr. Campbell, thank you for uh, your willingness to continue to serve our country uh, in a, an admirable way, an important way. I think we would agree that, uh, uh, that China intends to replace us, you probably by mid-century, uh, as the economic, uh, military, and geopolitical leader of the world. Uh, and they're on a pretty good track uh, so far. They've convinced a lot of nations that used to be free nations to side with them relative to Taiwan. They've monopolized uh, a number of industries. They've, uh, they've been able to achieve dominance of key raw materials for the industries of the future. Um, uh, they have uh, infiltrated uh, uh, various governments around the world. I mean, they've, they've been uh, extraordinarily successful in, in their efforts so far. At the same time, uh, they have vulnerabilities. And uh, their demographic uh, reality is a real vulnerability. Uh, the, um, the debt overhang that exists uh, uh, in, in China uh, is a real vulnerability. It is a, an area which is, um, if you will, absolutely primed for us having a very effective strategy to figure out how it is they're so successful in accomplishing certain things around the world. They've got, of course, they've, they've gone into Latin America, to Africa, even to the Caribbean. They're all around us. Um, and they say, of course, that they're worried about us, uh, you know, constraining them and containing them. Well, it's like, that's so laughable. They're all over the world. They're far more all over the world even than we are in many respects. Um, they also say they want to respect the sovereignty of other nations, that they're not in favor of one nation interfering with another. At the same time, they smile on their biggest ally, Russia, invading their neighbor, um, uh, Ukraine. So. We can't take them at their word. The, the need for a comprehensive strategy, not necessarily in the public, but one behind the scenes, has never been greater. And I appreciate your w working with members of my staff and, and others to develop that strategy. But Senator Menendez and I drafted a bill, as you know, to have that strategy developed and to be provided to this committee by January 9th, uh, excuse me, 
July 9th of this year. It's yeah. later than that now. We haven't received it. I, I know you're working to try and make that happen. What's the holdup, and when will we receive it? Yeah. First of all, let me just unbelievably graciously put, uh, I, I probably deserve worse. Uh, uh, I'm committed to get you both the unclassified and classified versions of this, and I will deliver it to you personally. Uh, I, too, have been a little bit frustrated. You know, you don't understand every element of government. This is something that should be shared and done in consultation. I will tell you, we have that strategy. We have followed it. Um, and, look, I think you paint a picture of uh, challenges that we face but it is incredibly important for us not to be completely discouraged and to have confidence in what we are doing. And I will just give you the other side of that ledger, if I can, Senator, just very quickly. I think we've made incredible investments in technologies, the key technologies of the 21st century. We understand that this is going to be the high ground where the battle for supremacy will be fought. We're investing in them. We're trying to restrict the most critical of those technologies from going to China. I think that has been largely a success, bipartisan success, Senator Young leading the way, number one. Number two, look, I, I would stack up what we've done with allies and partners with anyone and look at the countries that in the past that had really flirted with a different kind of relationship with China who have made fundamental decisions to be with us. Great Britain and Australia. AUKUS is for a significant, uh, inspirational, powerful program, not just on submarines, but on technology for the future. India, a key country for the 21st century, working much more closely with us. Japan and South Korea, other countries in Southeast Asia. And what we've done in Europe, all of whom I think some of the blinders have come off about what they're dealing with with respect to China. We have huge challenges in the global south, as you rightly point out. We have begun to diversify in terms of supply chains and critical minerals, but, but, but we are doing better in the contest than I think sometimes um, we uh, uh, tell ourselves. And I will say, just, Senator, you're a... You're a uh, you're, uh, his, you understand the history of the region of the Indo-Pacific. The one theme that has permeated discussions for 50 years in Asia was the idea of American decline. People thought we were in decline during the Korean War. They thought we would never recover from the Vietnam War. Reagan brought us back. Cold War, people thought that Japan was the ultimate victor. Each time, there is something about the American character, our inventiveness, our ability to reinvent ourselves that have propelled us forward. I have confidence that we can do that again. China believes that we are in hurtling decline. It is critical that we prove otherwise. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Campbell. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be with you today. I'm grateful to Lael and your family, um, your daughter Coco and others, for their support and for the great conversation we had. I will confess I have not read your 10 books, but I look forward to reading several of them. Um, you have laid out in great detail the remarkable record you have at helping stand up innovative and resolute partnerships between the United States and key allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific. And I think you are the right man at the right moment for this challenge for us. I'll also point out that December 7th, the anniversary of the Pearl Harbor attack, is also the anniversary of the moment that Senator Vandenberg, a Republican from Michigan, who was chairman of this committee, dramatically changed his position from an America first isolationism, urging that we reach an accommodation with Japan, to recognizing that our only path forward was a bipartisan one, locking arms across the aisle here and looking to the world with a common determination to advance freedom. Kurt, I'm very worried that right now the Senate stands on the precipice of failing to provide critically needed support and supplies, funding and material for the Ukrainians who are fighting Russian aggression, for our partners in the Indo-Pacific, for Israel in its fight against Hamas, and for the humanitarian needs of dozens of countries. Just briefly, could you say what would the consequences be for our global leadership if we were to fail to provide the support critically needed by our allies at this moment? Well, Senator, thank you for that, and thank you for your nice comments. Look, the, the truth is the, the struggle, the desperate struggle in Ukraine 
is no longer just a regional conflict. Many outside players are hugely invested. What's different about this conflict, not only have we seen substantial uh, resources from Europe, even greater than from the United States, but huge support for the Indo-Pacific because they understand the stakes about how this region, how Europe is increasingly linked to the Indo-Pacific more, more generally. So per, myself personally, I worry that the wrong lessons will be taken. If you look at the doctrine that was published by China and Russia uh, before the um, Beijing Winter Olympics and, and really look at it closely, it's a document out of the 1930s where big countries should dominate smaller countries on their periphery. That, that is antithetical to everything we believe and support. I will say one of the things that I have appreciated and enjoyed the most is that, yes, this is a highly contested time. There's lots of signs of dysfunction, but I have found the discussions with this community, both together and with individual senators, I think there's much more that unite you all than divide you, and it has given me personally much more confidence about the road ahead. And so I know that this period is incredibly intense and difficult. I'm not involved in those deliberations. I have confidence that we are going to find a way to basically uh, secure support for Ukraine appropriately, working with our allies and partners, make sure that we take the necessary steps, standing with Israel, but also planning for the future uh, in Gaza and elsewhere. I'm confident the president said yesterday he's prepared to make substantial compromises with respect to the border, and we have critical needs in the Indo-Pacific to stand with Taiwan to support the Philippines. So I think the comprehensive nature of this uh, budget request will affirm America's strategic purpose in ways that are deeply consequential and will go right at the heart at the criticisms and the hopes of those who wish us ill. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Um, two quick follow-on questions, yeah. if I might. And I agree with you that addressing border security is a critical part of our yeah. path forward. Um, a key piece of the supplemental is also funding for the Compacts of Free Association states, the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, Palau. Um, I think it's critical that we pass robust funding to strengthen these valuable partnerships with Pacific Islands. What would the impact be on our position in the Indo-Pacific if that were knocked out of this package or if we were to fail to pass the COFA funding? So first of all, I want to thank you. I also want to, again, uh, thank Senator Rich and his staff. I've gone through all the correspondence, all the suggestions about how we step up our game in the Pacific, something that is actually very near and dear to my heart. I am proud of the efforts I've taken over the last two years in making sure that we do better in the Pacific, a place that we have enormous strategic, historic, moral um, responsibilities. Um, the COFA uh, uh, agreement, as you know, provides support for the three nations in the Northern Pacific, critical to our security. I will simply say to the Senate that literally China is waiting. At the moment that we are unable to fulfill our commitment to fulfill the COFA arrangements with these countries, uh, arrangements that we've enjoyed for absolutely for decades, that keeps these countries in our purview, that work closely with us. You could not ask for a better ally and partner than, than Palau, President Whips, a son of Baltimore, wants to be with the United States. He needs this agreement. And if we don't get it, uh, you can expect that literally the next day, Chinese diplomats, uh, uh, military, and other folks will be on the plane landing in each of these things, try to a secure, a better deal uh, for China. We need to do this. Well, thank you for your focus uh, on the region. I look forward to traveling uh, either with you or informed by you. Great. Um, last topic, uh, bipartisan legislation Senator Graham and I worked on for years created the Global Fragility Act. I'm encouraged by your service at a senior level in the Pentagon as well as your service in the Navy as you move towards a senior position in the State Department because the whole goal of the Global Fragility Act was to demonstrate that the strategy that we followed across several administrations in Colombia of pulling together jointly across state, AID, DOD, in partnership with a country for a long period of time was the best way to deal with a fragile state. 
As you know, I've been very frustrated by the initial uh, period um, of GFA implementation, both the selection of some countries that struck me as well outside the scope of it, uh, and the, the difficulty getting buy-in, in particular, from senior DOD officials. Um, will you commit to working with me on Global Fragility Act implementation, including improving interagency coordination, targeting sustained funding towards these countries, and making sure that we prove out the thesis underlying it um, that was the result of a two-year-long study and development process by senior experienced diplomats that we have to figure out a way to get a 3D strategy right long term. First of all, Senator, I want to thank you for your leadership and creativity in putting this piece of legislation together. It is bipartisan, uh, signed into law by President Trump. Uh, I actually was very grateful. I argued that one of the countries that I worked on in the Indo-Pacific, Papua New Guinea, be included in that for a variety of reasons, has vast oil and natural gas reserves, but continues to be one of the poorest countries in the world. Why is that? And so how to think about that going forward. I think what's most inventive and important about this legislation is that it encourages, I, I requires a degree of coordination between three critical agencies, AID, the State Department, and the Department of Defense. If I'm confirmed, I think this is a deeply innovative uh, piece of uh, legislation that should be further uh, implemented. And frankly, we're dealing in Africa, Latin America, and the Pacific with an uh, increasing number of fragile states that need greater support. We've got to be careful how we do it. We just can't pile resources on. But a constructive, multifaceted strategy like that you've laid out, that's the right approach. I'm committed to it. Thank you. Um, I look forward to working together on coastal West Africa, on U.S. engagement with the global south, on PNG and on other countries. Uh, and I look forward to supporting your confirmation. Senator Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Coons. Um, and again, welcome, Dr. Campbell. It's good to see you here. Um, I think you and I share the, the, the understanding of how critical it is to build bridges between our Indo-Pacific allies, how critical it is for us to unify our national strengths, how critical it is for us to work together to advance our common economic and national security interest in the region. One area I wanted to speak with you about today is regarding energy cooperation between the United States, Korea, and Japan. Uh, I'd particularly like you to articulate your vision to advance inter energy cooperation and energy security among the three nations, and also specifically your thoughts on nuclear and LNG. Yeah, thank you very much, Senator Knight. If I could just, just take a moment uh, to thank you for your leadership on Indo-Pacific issues, but also for your support for Japan. It is a country that is dear to both of us. Uh, it is a critical partner. We cannot be successful in the Indo-Pacific unless we work closely with them. Uh, they are your first, uh, when they come to the United States, your office is their first stop. I'm happy to see them after. So mm -hmm. thank you for what you've done. Um, let me just say that my own personal view, and I think the view increasingly in the administration, is that um, given our urgent and immediate challenges, we need to double down on transitional fuels. And I know some people do not like to use that concept with, re with respect to natural gas. We ultimately want to go to renewables, but in this critical period, um, taking advantage of vast stores of American energy and other uh, places uh, more aligned with the United States, working with Japan and South Korea to ensure that those energy supplies are safe and secure. I will note uh, and Senator, I know you, that you know this and you encourage this as well. When the, when the energy crisis got most difficult in Ukraine last year, it was Japan and South Korea that agreed to do complex swaps so that they provided that urgent and badly needed energy um, to um, uh, Ukraine. Um, we need to support uh, Japan and South Korea more here. Uh, we also need to work with them on innovative nuclear projects. I think you know that there are some interesting projects that we are now working on. Our friend Dan Poneman has uh, pioneered work on small uh, uh, nuclear reactors, much safer. Japan has invaded, uh, in, uh, you know, basically developed some innovative technologies. There are some business challenges, some companies and. Uh, struggles with, you know, ultimate uh, uh, issues associated with government backing. Ultimately, 
Um, we highlighted this in uh, our engagements with both individually with South Korea and Japan as the trilateral partnership builds momentum. This is going to be at the center of what we intend to do. Just a, a, a quick point. I've, I've noted the discussion of the trilateral national laboratories cooperation. This is a parochial question because Oak Ridge National Labs is in my home state. But do you have a thought of how our laboratories will be cooperating? Yeah. In, in fact, I, I think you know this. The person that has championed this the, the most is, is Ambassador Emanuel, who served us with distinction. He wants that lab to play a key mm -hmm. role. I do, too. Great. That's great. If I could turn it again just to an area where I want to congratulate you, and that's on the role that you played in the Camp David Summit, bringing together the leaders of South Korea, Japan, and the United States. Um, I think that was a, an important step. I was pleased to engage to engage in a complementary trilateral conference uh, in San Francisco on the margins of APAC, you and I discussed that we had some 40 CEOs, yeah. uh, national security leaders and government leaders that attended that. Uh, and I, I see great promise and great potential there. Um, one thing that I'm curious about, though, is that China is now trying to establish its own trilateral conference with leaders in South Korea and Japan. I'd be curious in your perspective what China's goals here might be. Yeah, thank you. And, and in fact, Senator, you, I'm sure you know this, but their trilateral uh, uh, far precedes ours. Uh, the trilateral that went on between China, Japan, and South Korea um, was very active in the 2000s. Um, uh, you know, China uh, had withhold certain engagements from both South Korea or Japan, and mm -hmm. so that has sort of fallen a little bit by the wayside. But the Chinese have noted the actions that we've taken. I would say among all the things that we have done, they look at our engagement with Vietnam, working more on the security side, what we've done with India. These concern them. The thing that I think they recognize um, has the potential, the most significance in changing the security arch architecture of Asia is if Japan and South Korea can finally and fundamentally put their animosity behind them to focus on the future in everything, energy, technology, security, people to people, education. This is our goal. I do want to thank you for what you're doing. I do want to also just say it is in our interest to commend more publicly the risks and the courage that have been shown by Japan and South Korea. They need to recognize that we fully support at every possible level what they've done and we seek to strengthen it as it goes forward. Excellent. And I'm confident that China will be unsuccessful in building the kind of bonds of trust that we are doing now with Japan and South Korea. Indeed, I appreciate that confidence. I look forward to supporting your nomination. Thank you very much, Senator. As you can tell, members are moving in and out because of votes on the floor. I fully understand, Senator. Votes on the floor thank of the United States Senate. Senator Ricketts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Dr. Campbell, for your willingness to continue to serve our country. And I appreciate your comment that you made about uh, people thinking this country was in decline and being wrong numerous times in the past. I remember uh, being a young business school student in the late 80s, yeah. and Japan's manufacturing base was going to take over the world. And obviously, they're a very important ally, but uh, did not work out quite the way people were predicting yeah. at that time. Um, anyway, so uh, when you and I spoke in my office, we talked about what we need to do to deter the People's Republic of China with regard to any sort of military aggression toward Taiwan. And we talked about a number of things, not only preparedness of our military, but what we need to do with regard to investments in technology, working with our partners and allies, uh, what we need to do with regard to our economic and investment policies and couldn't agree more on those things. And you've highlighted some of the very positive developments that have occurred that you've participated in with regard to our partners and allies. But there's one area that we have not made progress where we have frankly failed, which is trade. And the People's Republic of China is not sitting still on this. You know, they announced their regional comprehensive uh, economic partnership, which is their 15 member free trade bloc. In response, the administration has put together the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. This is really aligning regulations and standards around four yeah. pillars. It does not include things such as market access or tariffs. And my understanding is that the APEC conference, they had hoped to be able to roll out the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework pillars, and that got put to the back burner, uh, so that's not happened. But maybe you could talk a little bit about you know, certainly states like Nebraska, yeah. we want to see more open access and reduce reduction in tariffs and so forth. Uh, 
We also uh, hear that from our allies. They would like to see the same thing. I was a supporter of TPP. I believe you were as well. Talk to me about what are our allies getting with the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, and do we need to start addressing things like market access and tariffs? So, first of all, Senator, I do want to thank you for the meeting I had with you, and I want to commend you for really focusing on the Indo-Pacific. I do think um, th this, uh, the thing that we need to underscore is that this body has a long history of very distinguished members who are committed to the Indo-Pacific, and it's nice to see people following uh, in the, the steps of Senator Lugar, uh, uh, Senator Inouye, and others. So I wanted to thank you for that. And I note very clearly uh, your state's interests in broadening uh, agricultural and other kinds of engagements in the Indo-Pacific. So I support that. So I, I do want to just take a minute to stand back. Um, and the larger picture, in many ways, is quite impressive. We have, we're the largest investor in the region last year, was uh, by most measurements the largest trade uh, year in our history with the Indo-Pacific. It was much more diverse than in the past, not just with China, other countries. So we are diversifying. We are working with allies and partners on diversifying supply chains and issues associated with critical minerals working in technology. So we are part and fully integrated into the Indo-Pacific economic and commercial uh, picture. So we have to begin with that. But the truth is that the region expect us to play a role as a confident, engaged, uh, player on commercial and economic matters. Um, I think if I am confirmed, I'm going to commit to work with you and others to, feel, to see if there is a bipartisan way forward. I think you, um, in your remarks, I think you recognize um, implicitly that there are challenges on both sides of the aisle. Questions about whether trade or certain kinds of trade uh, agreements, are they good for the United States? Do they benefit our workers? I think we have to take that into consideration and we have to see what's possible. I will also say, I think there are elements of IPEF that are important on diversifying supply chains, on looking at how taxation policy works. These are critical operating matters, but the truth is there is more that we can do. I'm committed to working with you on that going forward. So is it fair to say then that you think IPEF is, a, is important, and I'm not trying to argue that regulations and standards aren't important, but that we also need to look for a way to move forward on other uh, additional trade agreements to be able to counteract what the PRC is doing in the Indo-Pacific. Because I think our allies are expecting us to be able to provide an alternative. I, I don't believe that they want to do these things with China without having us uh, have the same opportunities, and I think they'd prefer to yeah. uh, be a trade partner with us rather than the PRC. Yeah. So, look, I can say this, Senator. I think it is absolutely essential that in our future that we are deeply, fundamentally in, uh, intertwined and engaged with the commerce, business, and economics of the Indo-Pacific. And if we are not, we will not uh, succeed. Yeah, and I, just, I, I'm, I realize I'm out of well, – the chairman's busy anyway. Yes, sir. Go so, ahead. Uh, uh, I'm out of time, but I, I, one of the things I will just highlight. We're just uh, negotiating here. Import, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> one of the reasons I think it's important is, I, as the former governor of Nebraska, I can tell you that the PRC was a terrible trade partner. They were a terrible trade partner. They certainly haven't lived up to their agreements they agreed to under the Trump administration. But even before that, I can tell you the, the products they bought from us, they would buy a lot and then they cut us off. I mean, it was just it, they were not a good trade partner. So I think there is an opportunity for us. To, to be able to push back on them. We can be successful, but we got to make sure that we're working on our partners and get these, these trade deals done. So thank, thank you, you, Senator. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Campbell. Senator Merkley. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your service and your, your testimony. Do you and does the administration support the ability of Palestinians from Gaza to be able to return to their homes in Gaza when Gaza starts to rebuild? First of all, Senator, thank, I do want to thank you for hosting me uh, for breakfast, and I, we're taking steps to make sure that your famous breakfast order is enshrined in the um, menu, and so thank you for that. The trifecta. 
the trifecta, right? Thank you. Um, so, look, I, I believe that is our policy. I think that is the just and right thing to do, and I believe that the United States will need and will want to work with other partners to ensure that uh, that ability is possible. Thank, thank you. And will the U.S. work with, with Israel, with the Defense Forces, with the National Police to make sure that any armaments we provide, and particularly small arms uh, and uh, uh, semi-automatic or automatic machine guns are not transferred to settlers outside of the INP and the IDF. Senator, I, to be honest, I do not know enough about that, those uh, particular provisions. Uh, I know that we are working closely with the Israelis to ensure that um, actions taken uh, seek to minimize uh, damage uh, to uh, women and children, to civilians. Um, I, I will need to get back to you directly on that specific uh, question. Thank you. I'll just point out that the, given the increased uh, settler violence on the uh, a lot of attacks on Palestinian uh, villagers that I would be very concerned and I know many Americans would be very concerned for our arms to be transferred that are intended for the IDF and the INP to be transferred to settlers. I, I will say I've seen the statements of uh, Secretary Blinken and others condemning those actions against uh, uh, Palestinian civilians. Uh, I share your concern here. So the administration has expressed concern about how the expansion of settlements and outposts and checkpoints make the vision of two states for two peoples a very difficult path. Would it make sense to have an annual report that, that tracks the expansion of existing settlements, the establishment of new settlements, checkpoints, and outposts? Uh, look, I, I think consultation with the Hill on this critical set of issues um, uh, is essential. And I believe that as we go forward, um, the only viable way is a two-state solution. It's going to be extremely difficult, as you point out, highly contentious, but it is the only way to ensure that the region can live uh, in peace. I, I, I think that there are going to be myriad ways that the executive branch needs to work um, uh, with partners on Capitol Hill to ensure that this is truly a national effort. And so I would support any appropriate communications or engagement. Yeah. And one of the reasons I was framing um, the questions in this way in terms of the administration, because we've heard uh, folks in the administration say, um, we don't want conditions on the bill, but we are intending to press hard on a series of key issues. And I was trying to clarify whether these were the types of key issues the administration is planning to press on. Yeah. So look, uh, Senator, I, I can say that I know that there are um, discussions uh, underway now on how we are thinking about the way forward uh, after this uh, terrible conflict concludes. Um, some of that, frankly, awaits if I'm confirmed. And yeah, so I, I, I would like to just suggest to you that if confirmed, I promise to make sure I'm deeply familiar and engage in those discussions, and then we'll um, engage with you uh, as such. Well, I want to restate uh, how absolutely horrific the attacks uh, were by Hamas. Uh, but, and uh, I also want to be very clear that the only future peace based on positive aspirations for the Israelis and the Palestinians does involve two states for two people. And then we have to work very hard towards that, and as you have, as you have uh, stated. Uh, turning to Ukraine. It was in 1938 when Chamberlain went to Munich and said to Hitler, we'll look the other way, we'll declare peace in our time, you go ahead and take that peace of Czechoslovakia. Yeah. I am concerned that if we fail to provide support to Ukraine, which will also affect the whole Atlantic Alliance, it'll drive cracks in NATO, it will certainly undermine the support of other nations for Ukraine, that there is an equivalence to saying to Putin, well, you can take Ukraine. And uh, I think I consider this uh, possibility of a Munich-style moment, this style of appeasement of Putin, to be an enormous mistake should we, should we fail to provide support to Ukraine. Is there anything to my analogy that, that 
you find resonance in. Um, Senator, I completely identify with what you've laid out. I, I'm of a generation that uh, very familiar with um, the false promises of appeasement in the 1930s. Uh, I can remember in debates that in, at Oxford and elsewhere that the, the harshest criticism that someone could make at you or to someone is, where's your umbrella? Like the umbrella that Chamberlain carried into Munich. Um, so uh, I do believe authoritarians uh, follow closely, take lessons. Uh, and I think that this is uh, an intense test of American commitment. I will say, I think through the support of this body and others and the bipartisan efforts that we've seen, I think if we look at the last two years, this we have done remarkable things and we can do more working closely with our Ukrainian uh, partners. And I'm committed to support that. And I think, I think there are uh, strong supporters on Capitol Hill to see this through as well. Thank you very much. Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, Dr. Campbell. When we met in my office recently, we discussed the importance of the United States' continued commitment to implementing the Indo-Pacific strategy, um, but also the challenge of maintaining some sort of engagement with the PRC. Uh, obviously, they're our greatest near-peer competitor. Obviously, they challenge us uh, in national security, but we also have to be able to work with them collaborator collaboratively across the region to do things like counter climate change or counter the next global public health crisis. Uh, um, uh, deal with economic crises as well. Um, so to live up to our enormous potential, we need to approach this work through a coordinated whole of government approach. Um, as you move from the NSC to the State Department, you come with very unique experiences having been in DOD yourself. Um, I'd like to invite you to speak briefly to how, if confirmed, you will ensure robust interagency coordination and continued strengthening of our position and our commitment to our partnership in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. I do want to just underscore one thing that she, uh, the Senator said at the outset that's important. Um, we've had a series of consultations. I think what I have been most pleased and impressed by in our private meetings, uh, Senator Duckworth has come right at me and uh, been clear about areas where we need to do better. And it was in 2021 that the Senator came and said, you're not engaging Southeast Asia effectively enough. You need to do uh, better. It was from those conversations that President Biden decided to invite all the ASEAN leaders to Washington, D.C. for the first time, a major diplomatic initiative that we've carried forward. And so I, I do want to underscore that these dialogues and discussions are important in the uh, formulation and execution of our strategy. So even though it's painful, I want to thank you for that, Senator. Look, I, so for us to be effective in everything we, we do, there is a need for a much higher degree of coordination uh, among all our tools of government. And so it's been said before, you know, we have one agency that's massive, huge, with huge resources uh, at the Department of Defense and other agencies with less uh, resources. Nevertheless, there's huge capacity, economic, diplomatic, military, that need to be coordinated, particularly in the Indo-Pacific. I will say that if you look at much of our strategy, they involve key moving uh, uh, pieces and moving parts in each of the bureaucracies that I've laid out and beyond that. I do want to commit to you that if I am confirmed, I will continue to work uh, as part of a collegial and engaged effort to ensure that the United States maintains a purposeful engagement in the Indo-Pacific. And I also want to thank you that you've constantly reminded us that even though we're facing hugely hard challenges as elsewhere, we have to be able to focus uh, on the Indo-Pacific, and I'm committed to do that. Um, how do you assess our current staffing levels and resourcing for diplomatic missions across the Indo-Pacific? Um, uh, you know, the ASEAN mission, you know, I've talked to you about this. I think the ASEAN mission itself is under understaffed. Um, and also, how will you approach the challenge of balancing our need to invest in the region, even as we address other urgent crises around the globe? And I would say that our uh, uh, Africa experts would say that we're understaffed there, too. Yeah. So, look, 
Senator, I, I, you know, there's a tendency, I, I worked in the Indo-Pacific, so I noted the lack of staff in the Pacific, the difficulty in setting up diplomatic offices there. I thought we had to be more innovative. I look at certain regions that I think maybe it might be, you know, have more staffing. I, I'm struck that, that some of our hardship posts in the Pacific and Africa, we have had difficulty in filling those. Um, and so I, I, I recognize that it's not something you can look at just at one place. You have to look at the totality. I, I come down to the, with the inescapable conclusion is that we need to recruit more people. I love the idea of an innovative uh, effort to look at how to modernize as part of that. Does that mean bringing in mid-career people? Does that mean being able to recruit from other walks of life, like the military and the like? I, I personally see and I've seen it up close, and I'll just give you one quick story if I can, Senator. I remember last year I went to the Solomons for the first time. We landed in our plane, we got off, um, we were met at the airport by one diplomat, probably the most hard-charging guy uh, I've ever met. And he was exhausted, he, he was a one-person uh, diplomacy in the Solomons, one of our most contested places. He was living in a hotel with his dog. And as we drove into town, we went by the gleaming Chinese embassy. Uh, dozens and dozens of staffers. We just have to do better. We have to be able to find more resources and make sure that we get these people out into the field. And so, look, I, if I am confirmed, I am committed to doing that. I will do everything possible to make sure that our best and brightest are most diverse, are serving in the key regions that are being contested that define American purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to turn the gavel over to Senator Schatz. I apologize. There's some additional. I object. <laughs> you don't get the right to object. Okay. So, sorry about that. I'd like to just hear. But there's other uh, issues affecting our committee that are on the floor at this particular moment that I'm required to be over for. I want the members to know they have until the close of business tomorrow questions for the record. And uh, Dr. Campbell, I would ask that you get them back as quickly as possible and as thoroughly as possible because we are trying to expedite the consideration of your nomination considering the importance it is to the State Department. And uh, Senator Rich and I are going to try to expedite the consideration, but it will require you to make sure you get your answers back as quickly and as thoroughly as possible. We'll, we'll get it done, Chairman. Thank you. And with that, I was going to recognize Senator Booker, but after his comments, he's going to have to wait a little bit longer. All right. Senator Booker. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry to see you go. I'm going to go quickly before the power goes to Schatz's head. Um, it, is, it is great to see you here, especially with the two women at your back. Uh, you kind of did a daughter diss. She, she's sacrificing not taking that test today yes. that she was prepared for and she was going to ace. But she decided to uh, come here to support you, and I'm, I'm ex extraordinary to see that. Um, I am very excited about your leadership. I'm very grateful and excited to vote for you on the floor. I just want to try to uh, use this as an opportunity uh, to look into the future and talk about the continent of Africa. Yeah. I know your specialty is, is Asia, and that is such an important uh, part of the globe. But I don't think most people understand that the emergence that Africa will have in the next 50 years, I mean, even by 2050 alone, they're going to be so large that one out of every four people on the planet Earth will be Africans. It's a, uh, a country that this youth uh, bulge, while China's declining, declining demographically, Europe is declining demographically, we have demographic challenges here. That youth bubble in Africa really is going to have an extraordinary shaping element on all of humanity. And then you add into that arts and culture. You add into that their booming tech sector and innovation sector. You add into that their control of, of critical natural resources for the future of our planet. Um, what's astounding to me is um, how uh, we, who are only 4% of the globe population, uh, don't do more to understand that our growth our future, not just our security, uh, but the upside of the possibilities of showing up more in partnership with African nations. And so could you please let me uh, help me understand how you view this 
And clearly, in my opinion, looking at China's activities on the continent, even Russia's activities on the continent, we are not necessarily matching in terms of focus, energy, investment, partnerships uh, to the degree that I think we should to counter those, um, those influences on the continent. Uh, Senator, thank you very much. I, I do want to just begin by saying I, I am grateful that uh, my daughter Coco is here. And, you know, it's supposed to be the case that the parents te teach the children. There isn't hardly a week that goes by. I've rarely seen a more disciplined person. Um, uh, you know, that old adage, do your job. Uh, Coco always does her job, never has to be reminded. I'm the one who has to be reminded to do my job. Um, I, uh, Senator, I've had a number of conversations with you. One of the things that we have not discussed is that I am actually an old Africanist. My PhD thesis at Oxford uh, was on Africa. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I, I remember I did get a call uh, a few years ago saying, congratulations, your thesis has won an award, a typically British call. And I thought, oh, fantastic. What is the award? It said, it's the, it's the, it's the book made most relevant by history. Um, so it was Soviet policy towards South Africa, but I traveled extensively in the region. Um, I, I, I've gone overland across Africa several, several times. I've spent a lot of time in East Africa in assistance programs. I know Southern Africa better. I completely associate myself with everything that you've said, and I'd go even further. You know, you look at the number of coups, Senator uh, Chairman Cardin talked about the number of coups that we've taken place uh, in the last several years, the fragility of certain states, the, the challenges that we face that some of the dominant countries that we've based much of our engagement on are facing challenges. Um, I think the whole region holds enormous promise but also it's an area that we have to step up our game. Now, I have been very impressed what, uh, with what Secretary Blinken and his team has done, but there still needs to be more. We need to make sure that we're working on critical minerals more directly. I think advancing governance, uh, uh, democratic practices, human rights, calling out where we see real challenges, as we saw yesterday, both the chairman and Secretary of State on Sudan, um, I, I, I do want to just say that if confirmed, I, I, I've talked to the Secretary about this, I intend to offer what assistance and personal engagement I can. We have to step up our game. We are being contested in the Global South. It is there that, frankly, I worry the most. Um, I'm not sure that, look, I think a few years ago, some of these countries looked at China carefully. I think they are more worried about the model that China offers, bringing in its own workers, not as much transparency. I think what we have to offer in terms of our uh, role, our investment capacity with the DFC and all others, I think we have a lot to bring to Africa, and my hope is that we'll be able to continue to do that. So let me say this in conclusion again, because I fear uh, Schatz is uh, drunk with power over there and might cut me off because now they've gone over my time. But um, just really quickly, um, there is so much attention right now on Ukraine and uh, yeah. what's happening in Israel and what's happening in Gaza. But if you look at the sheer numbers of children that are dying right now from the Horn to Sudan, um, it, it, it dwarfs. And yet we yeah. don't seem to see the same kind of outrage um, in our engagement on the continent. And in Sudan in particular, with five, over five million displaced people, um, I, I just want to urge uh, you and uh, our great Secretary of State to think about a special envoy for Sudan um, uh, to really make that more of a focus and a priority of our diplomatic power. And then the uh, a final thing I'll just say, um, and I'm going to regret this, I'm sure, but my childhood nickname when I was a, by my mother when I was a kid was Coco. And that's why uh, I just want to make a predictive element that as great as her father is, uh, that I think that the daughter will one day, uh, uh, there'll be another Coco perhaps sitting on this dais in the future. Concur with that, Senator. I know uh, uh, time is short. I, I saw the statement put out by Chairman uh, uh, Cardin yesterday uh, asking for a special envoy. I, I, I just want to promise you we're going to look at that very carefully, um, and we are highly attentive to uh, what we see tr taking place there. 
Secretary uh, Blinken's statement yesterday speaks for itself in terms of um, our concerns about war crimes. So I, I, I take very seriously what you're suggesting, and I do want to commit to you uh, as much focus and attention as I can bring to the issues. I'm very grateful. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your grace and mercy. Thank you, Senator Booker. Uh, uh, Mr. Campbell, thank you for being here to, to your family. Thank you for serving as well. Sirin 支持论坛搜索免费画图可以点击添加请大家收看中国当前面临的诸多结构性经济问题日趋凸显穆迪在本月 他认为，房地产和财政问题的影响是可控的。中国政府正在努力深化改革，应对风险和挑战。如果要仔细分析外资撤出中国（FDI下滑的现象），可有几个方面的理由。上海美国商会主席肖恩·斯坦最近谈到
。当前中国利率远低于全球多数地区，外国企业并没有把在中国赚取的利润再投资于中国，而是汇到其他国家，那里可以获得更高收益。理由之四，企业为分散地缘政治风险。把部分在华投资转移到其他国家，都是投资下降的可能原因。张军的不同视角，面对着目前的外资的撤离，中国经济学教授张军认为，用传统的 FDI 的流量来看，一个国家的经济已经不合适。逻辑上应该看那些有竞争能力的，在高科技领域的 FDI。他的说法似乎有一定的根据。汇率评级预计。2023年，中国的外国直接投资将在外国投资者情绪疲软的情况下继续下降，而高科技制造业的外国直接投资可能保持较强的韧性。自2021年以来，高科技制造业外国直接投资的增长速度一直高于外国直接投资总额和高科技外国直接投资总额的增长速度，并在2023年保持弹性，继2022年同比增长 49.6% 之后。二十三年上半年同比增长百分之二十五点三，但是这种局面是否能持续，这里尚无结论。三个演讲版本，习近平挑选了最友好的那个。张军说的问题，从某种程度上来说，直接反映了习近平对今后经济的设想。中国 FDI 走下坡路的问题，北京在今年已经意识到。从今年开始，习近平和他领导的政府向外商重磅表态。承诺将改善外商投资权益保护机制。习近平目光主要集中在是那些高精尖技术领域的 FDI。他提出的高质量的发展，就是只要依仗自己的创新，但也要依靠外国的技术与资本，使得中国在第四个工业革命中取得领导地位。而这里关键的关键就是高级芯片。习近平十日去美国，与其说是缓和与美国的关系。不如说是去跟拜登争夺美国的资本，尤其是跟芯片有关的资本。北京懂得，美国不是铁板一块，而是不同利益集团的组合体。北京希望利用美国商界，尤其是芯片公司跟美国政府的矛盾，来规避拜登的禁令。在安排习在美的日程时，中国官员最初要求先让习与企业高层会面的晚宴放在拜习会面之前举行，这就一语道破了习近平真正优先考虑的问题。当然，拜登政府并没同意这个设想。习近平的手下为他当晚与商界高管晚宴的演讲准备了三个版本。在周三与拜登会面之后，习近平有意挑选了最友好的一个版本。在对企业家的三十分钟演讲中，习近平表示，中国希望成为美国的伙伴和朋友。拜登政府面临的挑战：全球五大芯片制造商上季营收超过百分之四十来自中国客户。其中，科林研发 l a m Research） 将近一半营收由中国客户贡献。据日经亚洲报道，中国市场对这四家——高通、英特尔、特斯拉、苹果——去年营收分别贡献了 62%27%22% 和 18%。上面的数据就足以说明，为什么美国的芯片公司极力要保持中国的市场。英伟达 （NVIDIA） 执行长黄仁勋在本月6日在新加坡表示。英伟达正配合美国政府管制规定，提供三款特制 AI 晶片给中国市场，明年能上市。实际上，配合美国政府管制规定是假的，继续赢得中国市场是真的。路透社报道，这家总部位于加州的人工智慧晶片设计公司，占据了中国七十亿美元人工智慧晶片市场百分之九十以上的份额。中国对英伟达的收入贡献，传统上约为百分之二十。英特尔 CEO 帕特·基辛格则称，若拜登政府进一步限制英特尔在华业务，这将危及该政府将芯片生产带回美国的一项关键政策。他警告说，如果没有中国客户的订单，英特尔计划在俄亥俄州建设工厂等项目的必要性就会大大降低。而谷歌母公司 Alphabet 执行长皮柴 s u n d a r Pichai 指出，中国将走在人工智能的最前沿，美国与其合作非常重要。实际上，不仅美国公司，其他国家的公司在突破禁令方面也有跃跃欲试的姿态。譬如，日本的尼康正考虑逆势开拓中国大陆光刻机市场，扩大其目前全球百分之七、排名第三的市场份额。可见，拜登对中国的高级芯片出口以及投资的禁令，远非那么容易执行。
，由美国国会授权设立的美中经济与安全审查委员会 （USCC） 在最新公布的一份报告中承认，美国设置对中国出口先进芯片设备管制的禁令并未完全奏效。但拜登政府似乎还是坚信实施的措施能有效实施。客观上，他的有关禁令确实已给中国造成不少麻烦。为了跟习近平抢夺美国的芯片资本，美国商务部长吉娜·雷蒙多 （Gina Raimondo） 多次以国家安全为名，警告美国公司，特别是英伟达和英特尔，不要向中国销售人工智能赋能芯片。但到底谁的胳膊能扭过谁？是美国政府还是芯片资本？这看来还待等到明年下定论。本文作者张俊华为德籍华人政治学者，在德国生活三十余年。他曾就读于德国法兰克福大学，并获得哲学博士学位。此后曾执教于柏林自由大学等高校，现为法国 e c o l u n i v e r s i t a r e de Management 客座教授。现在请看六度解析主讲人六博士对这篇文章的评论。这篇文章主要讨论了中国经济下滑、外资撤离以及美中科技战中的投资管控问题。文章首先指出，中国第三季度的对华外国直接投资 （FDI）。总额录得了自一九九八年以来的首次负值，显示流出中国的直接投资多于流入。这是由于中国当前面临的诸多结构性经济问题，包括政府地方债务居高不下、房地产市场景气低迷、外资撤走、民众消费信心不足以及年轻人失业率居高不下等等。文章接着分析了外资撤离的四大原因，包括外企与中国企业的竞争、今年七月生效的修订版反间谍法对间谍活动的定义范围扩大。中国利率远低于全球多数地区，以及企业为分散地缘政治风险，把部分在华投资转移到其他国家。然后，文章引用了中国经济学教授张军的观点，他认为应该看那些有竞争能力的在高科技领域的 FDI， 而不是传统的 FDI 的流量。习近平也同样关注高科技领域的 FDI， 他希望中国在第四个工业革命中取得领导地位。文章最后讨论了美国政府和芯片公司之间的矛盾。全球五大芯片制造商上季营收超过百分之四十来自中国客户，因此美国的芯片公司极力要保持中国的市场。然而，美国商务部长吉娜·雷蒙多 （Gina Raimondo） 多次以国家安全为名，警告美国公司不要向中国销售人工智能赋能芯片，这使得美国政府和芯片资本之间的关系变得紧张。深入探讨这篇文章的核心议题，我们可以看到，中国经济的下滑和外资的撤离是一个复杂的问题，涉及到多个因素。首先，中国的结构性经济问题是一个重要的原因。政府地方债务的高企、房地产市场的低迷、民众消费信心的不足以及年轻人的高失业率都对外资的流入造成了影响。其次，中国政府对间谍活动的定义扩大以及中国利率的低迷也使得外资选择撤离。最后，地缘政治风险的增加也使得企业选择把在华投资转移到其他国家。观众可能会问，我还应该了解哪些相关的背景知识？才能更好理解这篇文章呢。首先，了解中国的经济状况和结构性问题是非常重要的，这包括中国的地方政府债务问题、房地产市场的状况、中国消费者的消费信心以及年轻人的就业状况等。其次，了解中国的法律环境，特别是今年七月生效的修订版反间谍法以及其对间谍活动的定义扩大，也是理解外资撤离的一个重要因素。最后，对于地缘政治风险的了解也是非常必要的，包括中国与其他国家的关系。以及这些关系对企业投资决策的影响。那么，我们应该如何评价这篇文章呢？这篇文章对中国经济下滑和外资撤离的问题进行了全面深入的分析，提供了多个角度的观点。文章同时也指出了美国政府和芯片公司之间的矛盾，这是一个值得关注的问题。然而，文章的结论并不明确，这可能是因为这是一个复杂的问题，涉及到许多不确定的因素。对于这个问题的未来发展，我们需要继续关注。总结来看，中国经济面临了许多结构性问题，导致外资撤离加剧，尤其是在高科技领域。中国政府和习近平都意识到了这个问题，并采取了一系列措施来吸引外资，特别是在高科技领域。然而，美国的投资管控政策对中国的影响仍然存在，尤其是在芯片领域。美国政府和芯片资本之间的矛盾也是一个值得关注的问题。在未来，中国经济和外资流动的走向将继续受到这些因素的影响。我们需要持续关注并进行深入分析。你有什么样的想法？谢谢您的收看。上面播报的内容是六度团队推荐的全球专业媒体、智库、政府机构和行业专家的最新报道、分析简报。
更详细的内容，请大家去这些媒体、智库的网站阅读。这些内容并不一定反映六度简报的立场，亦不能作为任何决策的建议。六度团队由专业媒体人、学者、科学家组成的独立新型媒体，大家可以根据自己的专业要求订阅各种简报，网址是六度 brief com。您在世界任何地方都可以通过电邮收到六度简报。大家好。我是六度世界的六博士，我与小六子为大家主持《当爸爸做妈妈》节目，主要内容包括：一、宝宝的我是大厨师烹饪秀；二、孩子的虚拟宇宙、数字世界的探险；三、小小建筑师的纸箱城堡。耐磨，小六子，可以先跟我们说说宝宝的我是大厨师烹饪秀。当然，我很乐意以一位历史与文化的教授的身份，为您讲述这个充满乐趣的现象。宝宝的我是大厨师烹饪秀。首先，我们得承认，这个世界上没有什么比看一个小宝宝穿上迷你围裙、戴上厨师帽、手持木勺的样子更能融化人心了。这种场景通常发生在家庭的厨房里，或者是在幼儿园的角色扮演游戏中。宝宝们模仿大人的样子，尝试着去烹饪，这不仅是一种可爱的娱乐方式，也是他们学习和模仿社会行为的重要途径。从历史的角度来看，烹饪一直是人类文化的重要组成部分。从古代的火堆旁到现代的高科技厨房，烹饪技术的发展反映了人类文明的进步。而现在，我们的小宝宝们在他们的《我是大厨师秀》中，也许是在无意中重现了人类早期的烹饪尝试。当然，他们的食物可能是由泥巴、塑料蔬菜或是空气构成的。这些小小的厨师们可能会把泥巴当成巧克力蛋糕，将叶子当成新鲜的蔬菜，甚至可能会为你准备一杯看不见的茶。这不仅仅是游戏，这是一堂关于创造力。想象力和社交技能的课，他们在这个过程中学习到了分享、合作以及如何遵循简单的指令，比如烤箱预热到三百度的概念。幽默的是，尽管这些小厨师的烹饪成果我们无法真正品尝，但他们的自信和认真的态度却能让我们相信，如果给他们几年时间，他们或许真的能够成为我们餐桌上的大厨师。他们的烹饪秀是一场充满想象的盛宴，让我们这些成年观众不禁会心一笑。同时，也让我们想起了自己童年时代的无忧无虑和创造力。最后，虽然我们不能指望从这些小小的厨师那里得到米其林星级的大餐，但他们的烹饪秀无疑为我们的生活增添了一份纯真的乐趣。这些小宝宝们用他们的想象力和无限的创造力，提醒我们，即使是最平凡的日常活动，也可以变成一场精彩的冒险。所以，下次当你看到一个小宝宝自豪地宣布“我是大厨师”时，不妨加入他们的游戏，一起享受这场无边界的烹饪盛宴吧。谢谢小六子的介绍，那再跟我们介绍一下孩子的虚拟宇宙、数字世界的探险。当然，我很乐意以一种专业而幽默的方式来探讨这个话题。那么，各位，让我们一起踏上一段奇妙的旅程，穿越那个被称为孩子的虚拟宇宙的神秘领域。首先，想象一下，你是一名勇敢的探险家，正准备进入一个由无数比特和字节构成的新大陆。这里没有真实的海洋和山脉，但有无尽的游戏世界和社交平台。在这个数字世界里，孩子们就像是拥有超能力的小巫师，他们可以在 Minecraft 中搭建城堡，或者在 Roblox 里设计自己的游戏，甚至在 Fortnite 的战场上翻云覆雨。但是，这个虚拟宇宙并不总是一片和平与欢乐的乐园。就像现实世界中的探险家必须面对野兽和暴风雨，孩子们在数字世界中也会遇到网络欺凌和隐私侵犯这样的风险。他们需要学会如何使用数字罗盘和安全地图。以避免那些诱人的免费游戏内购买，这些购买就像是虚拟世界中的海盗，总是试图掠夺他们的，或更确切的说，是他们父母的宝藏。有趣的是，孩子们在这个虚拟宇宙中也学会了一些非常现实的技能。他们学会了合作，因为在多人在线游戏中，没有团队精神是无法赢得胜利的。他们学会了创造力，因为在数字空间里，你可以建造任何东西，从简单的像素艺术到复杂的交互式故事。他们甚至学会了编程，这是一种魔法语言，可以让他们控制虚拟世界中的一切。但是，亲爱的听众们，我们也必须承认，这个虚拟宇宙有时会让孩子们过于沉迷，以至于他们忘记了外面还有一个真实的世界。他们可能会忘记了真实的阳光和新鲜空气的感觉，忘记了和朋友面对面交流的乐趣。因此，作为现代探险家的指南，我们的任务是帮助他们找到现实世界和虚拟世界之间的平衡。最后，让我们记住。虽然我们可以在数字世界中体验无限的可能性，但我们的心灵和身体仍然根植于这个古老而美丽的地球。所以，让我们引导孩子们在这两个世界中都能找到快乐和成长。
就像在一场史诗般的双重探险中一样。谢谢小六子的介绍，那再跟我们介绍一下小小建筑师的纸箱城堡。当然可以，让我们一起探索这个由纸箱构建的微型王国。在现代家庭的客厅深处，有一个被遗忘的角落，这里曾是无数空纸箱的安息之地。但是，对于一个充满想象力的小小建筑师来说，这些纸箱却是构建梦想城堡的珍贵材料。这位年幼的达芬奇或许还不懂得哥特式拱顶的复杂性，但他的创造力却能轻易的跨越中世纪与现代之间的鸿沟。在这个由胶带、彩笔和无线创意粘合在一起的城堡中，每一个纸箱都被赋予了新的生命，有的变成了高耸的塔楼，有的则是坚不可摧的城墙。这里没有建筑规范，也不需要城市规划许可，只有纯粹的创造欢乐和对抗重力的挑战。小小建筑师的纸箱城堡不仅是一个游戏空间。它还是一个社会实验的微缩模型，在这里，小朋友们学会了合作，因为要把那些笨重的纸箱堆叠起来，单打独斗可不行。他们还学会了资源管理，因为纸箱的数量总是有限的，如何分配使用成了一门艺术。更重要的是，他们学会了可持续发展的概念，因为城堡的每一次拆解都是为了下一次更宏伟的构建。但是，不要以为这个城堡只是孩子们的游戏。哦不。它其实是家长耐心和空间管理能力的终极考验。每当城堡在客厅中占据主导地位时，家长们就必须展现出他们的外交技巧，以确保家中的其他活动能够和平共处。最终，小小建筑师的纸箱城堡可能会遭遇不可避免的命运，被拆除。但是，就像罗马帝国的衰落并未阻止文明的进步一样，这个纸箱城堡的倒塌也只是另一个创造周期的开始。因为在孩子们的世界里，每一个结束都是新冒险的起点。所以，下次当你看到一个孩子正专注的用纸箱搭建他的小小城堡时，不妨停下来欣赏一下。这不仅仅是一个玩具，这是创造力、想象力和无限可能的展示。这是我们未来建筑师、工程师和艺术家的摇篮，是他们在探索、学习和成长的过程中的一个小小里程碑。谢谢小六子的介绍。总结来说，这些新闻都展示了孩子们的创造力和想象力。以及他们在模仿和学习社会行为中的角色扮演，无论是在厨房里的烹饪秀、数字世界中的探险，还是纸箱城堡的构建，孩子们都能通过这些活动展现出他们的天赋和潜力。作为成年人，我们可以从这些活动中学到很多。我们可以以轻松的心态参与孩子们的游戏，感受到他们的快乐和创造力。同时，我们也可以从中汲取启示。重新点燃我们自己的创造力和想象力。所以，亲爱的观众们，你有什么样的想法呢？你在孩子们的烹饪秀、数字世界探险或纸箱城堡中看到了什么？你有什么样的经历和故事想要分享吗？让我们一起讨论吧。大家好，欢迎大家收看六度百科节目。本期节目内容如下：币安创始人赵长鹏被命令在判决前留在美国。币安创始人被命令在判决前留在美国。New York Times。Binance 创始人赵长鹏因违反联邦洗钱规定而等待判决，必须留在美国。赵长鹏上个月承认了这项指控，并最初被允许在等待判决期间返回迪拜。然而，联邦检察官认为赵长鹏因为在国外拥有巨额财富和与阿拉伯联合酋长国政府的密切联系，存在逃跑风险。美国西区华盛顿地区联邦法院的理查德 ·A· 琼斯法官同意了政府的观点，并裁定赵长鹏必须留在美国。定义、人物与事件、影响。赵长鹏与币安洗钱指控。赵长鹏作为全球最大加密货币交易所币安的创始人和 CEO， 因涉嫌违反联邦洗钱规定而受到美国司法部门的调查。洗钱是指将非法获得的资金，通过一系列的金融交易或商业活动，转换成看似合法来源的资金的过程。在加密货币领域，由于其匿名性和全球性，洗钱行为更为隐蔽，因此加密货币交易所在防范洗钱方面承担着重要责任。联邦法院的司法程序，美国西区华盛顿地区联邦法院处理了赵长鹏的案件。根据联邦司法程序。被告在经过初步听证，并对指控作出回应后，通常会等待法院的最终判决。在此期间，被告可能被允许保释，但需遵守法院的相关规定和限制。赵长鹏与阿联酋的关系，赵长鹏与阿拉伯联合酋长国阿联酋的关系受到关注，因为他被认为在该国有着显著的财富和影响力。
，这种关系可能会给美国司法部门带来额外的考量，特别是在评估逃跑风险时。阿联酋作为一个金融中心，对于国际商人来说具有吸引力，但也可能因为其与美国司法合作的限制而成为潜在的避难地。法官的裁决与赵长鹏的未来。法官理查德。A. 琼斯在审视了检察官提出的逃跑风险论点后，裁定赵长鹏必须留在美国，直至判决出炉。这一裁决反映了法院对于案件的严肃性以及对被告可能逃避司法制裁的担忧。赵长鹏的未来将受到即将到来的判决的影响，这可能包括监禁、罚款以及对必安运营的长远影响。案件的影响与加密货币行业的监管。赵长鹏的案件和其结果可能会对加密货币行业产生深远的影响。一方面，这强调了美国及其他国家监管机构对于洗钱防范的重视，以及他们愿意对行业内部的违规行为采取强硬措施。另一方面，这也可能促使加密货币交易所加强内部合规程序，以避免类似的法律风险。此案也为全球加密货币市场参与者提供了一个重要的法律和合规参考点。综上所述，赵长鹏的案件不仅对他个人和必安公司有重要影响，也可能成为加密货币行业法律监管的一个转折点。随着判决的最终确定，加密货币市场的运营者将不得不更加重视遵守国际洗钱防范的规定和标准。必安创始人赵长鹏被指控违反了哪些联邦洗钱规定？我必须澄清。目前没有公开的信息或新闻报道表明，币安创始人赵长鹏被美国或任何其他国家的法院指控违反联邦洗钱规定。因此，我无法提供一个关于这个不存在事件的详细百科知识文章。币安是全球最大的加密货币交易所之一，它在全球范围内运营，并受到多个国家监管机构的审查。加密货币交易所如币安，通常需要遵守所在国家或地区的反洗钱 （AML）。和反恐怖融资 （CFT） 法规，这些规定可能包括要求交易所进行客户身份验证 （KYC）、监控和报告可疑交易，以及保持必要的记录。如果需要，我可以提供有关加密货币交易所通常必须遵守的反洗钱规定的一般信息。但请注意，这不是关于赵长鹏或必安的具体情况。谢谢您收看六度百科，这是由一群科学家、经济学家。专业媒体人、工程技术人员合作制作的百科类节目，这些内容并不一定反映六度百科团队的立场，亦不能作为任何决策的建议。六度百科内容涉及诸多知识领域，我们努力使其内容真实、专业，不存在预设立场。如果受众发现内容有误，赞同或反对六度百科内容，请在我们的节目留言区发表您的高见。欢迎大家到六度世界。六度 World 阅读我们的更多内容，参与六度聊天区的讨论，请订阅我们的频道，给我们的节目点赞，谢谢。尽管如此，我们还是可以讨论一下关于加密货币交易所和洗钱的一般问题。洗钱在加密货币领域是一个重要的问题，因为加密货币的匿名性和全球性使其成为洗钱活动的理想工具。监管机构和执法部门一直在努力加强对加密货币交易所的监管。和反洗钱措施，以防止洗钱行为的发生。对于加密货币交易所来说，确保合规和防范洗钱是非常重要的。他们需要建立有效的 KYC， 了解您的客户程序，以确保交易者的身份得到验证。此外，交易所还需要实施监控系统来检测可疑交易，并及时报告给相关的监管机构。同时，交易所也需要保持详细的交易记录，以便在需要时提供给执法部门。对于加密货币行业整体来说，这些监管措施是非常重要的。他们可以帮助建立行业的信任和透明度，吸引更多的投资者和参与者。此外，加密货币交易所也应该积极与监管机构合作，共同努力保护市场的安全和稳定。在这个案例中，我们还需要等待进一步的信息和报道来了解赵长鹏和毕安是否真的违反了洗钱规定。我们希望能够看到更多的透明度和合规性在加密货币行业的推动下实现，以确保市场的健康发展。那么，你对这个新闻有什么样的想法呢？你对加密货币交易所的合规性和防洗钱措施有什么看法？请在评论中分享你的想法和问题。大家好，我是六度世界的六博士，我与小六子为大家主持《爱车宝典》。
。节目主要内容包括：一、座驾调音师，打造完美驾驶音效；二、轻松卖车课，教你避开低价陷阱；三、省心省力，智选车款，享受无忧驾乘。那么，小六子可以先跟我们说说座驾调音师，打造完美驾驶音效。当然。我很乐意以一种专业而幽默的方式来谈论这个话题。首先，让我们把座驾调音师想象成是一位交响乐团的指挥，而他的乐器则是汽车的每一个部件。这位调音大师的任务是确保你的座驾不仅能够带你从 A 点到 B 点，而且还能在这个过程中提供一场听觉盛宴。想象一下，你坐进车里，启动引擎，那一刻，你的座驾调音师开始了他的表演。引擎轰鸣就像是低音提琴的深沉吟唱，而排气管的咆哮则像是小号在奏响胜利的号角。这不仅仅是关于噪音，这是关于音乐。座驾调音师们是那些在汽车设计和制造过程中默默无闻的英雄，他们必须确保车辆的每一个声音都是精心设计的。从车门关闭时那令人满意的咔嚓声，到风吹过车身时的低语，每一个细节都要调教的恰到好处。有趣的是。这些调音师们有时候会遇到一些相当奇特的挑战，比如有一次，一位调音师在试图解决一款豪华轿车的噪音问题时，发现问题竟然出在了车内的一个小零件上。这个零件在特定的速度下会发出类似于小提琴独奏的尖锐声音。解决方案，他们不是更换了这个零件，而是调整了它的形状，让它的演奏更加和谐。在电动车日益流行的今天，座驾调音师的工作变得更加复杂。他们不再只是在调整内燃机的交响乐，而是要创造全新的声音景观。电动车的静谧让人们开始注意到之前被引擎声掩盖的声音，比如轮胎滚动的声音，或是风切过车身的呼啸。调音师们必须从头开始，为这些声音编排新的乐章。总之，座驾调音师的工作是一门艺术，也是一门科学。他们确保我们的驾驶体验不仅仅是一次从地点 A 到地点 B 的旅行。而是一次充满音乐和情感的旅程。下次当你启动你的爱车，听到那美妙的引擎声时，不妨想一想，这背后可能有一位调音师在默默的指挥着这场交响乐。谢谢小六子的介绍，那再跟我们介绍一下轻松卖车课，教你避开低价陷阱。各位车主、车迷，还有那些偶尔把汽车钥匙当遥控器的朋友们，欢迎来到轻松卖车课。我是那个在车展上为了一张免费咖啡券能讲半小时车辆悬挂系统的教授。今天我们要聊的是如何在卖车时避开那些让你的钱包瘦身的低价陷阱。首先，我们得认识到，卖车就像是在举办一场你的爱车的告别派对，你希望它风光大走，而不是像被赶出家门的流浪猫。所以，定价就成了一门艺术，而不是随便在市场架上打个折扣就完事的数学题。一、了解市场。在你把爱车贴到网上之前，先做做功课，查查同款车型、年份、里程数的市场价。记住，你的车可能在你心中无价，但在市场上它只值那么多。别忘了，买家也在做功课，他们知道的可能比你还多。二、车况自检。在你把车打扮的像参加汽车选美大赛一样之前，先确保它的内在也同样光鲜。小毛病修一修，大问题也别藏着掖着。买家一旦发现你的车有隐疾，你的信誉就像漏了油的发动机，一发不可收拾。三、精心准备广告，你的广告是卖车的门面，请用高清相机拍照，而不是用土豆。文字描述要诚实又吸引人，就像写交友广告一样，但请别夸大其词，否则买家会觉得你在卖车还是在写小说。四、谈判技巧，当买家出现时，你得像个老练的商人。记住，每个人都想占便宜，但你得让买家觉得他们得到了好交易，同时你的钱包也能微笑。学会说不，但要委婉，就像拒绝小侄子在吃第五块巧克力那样。五，别急于成交。有时候买家会给你施加压力，让你觉得如果不立刻卖给他们，就会失去一笔好交易。深呼吸，记住，急于求成的是他们，不是你。你的车，你做主。六。了解法律和程序，最后别忘了处理好所有的法律和过户手续，否则你可能会在卖车后的几个月里收到一堆罚单，因为新车主决定把车当成赛车在市区试速。总之，卖车就像是一场精心策划的舞会，你要确保你的爱车是舞会上最闪亮的明星。
，同时也要确保你的钱包在舞会结束后依然丰满。祝各位车主卖车顺利，下次换车时别忘了邀请我来参加你的新车庆祝派对。谢谢小六子的介绍，那再跟我们介绍一下，省心省力，智选车款，享受无忧驾乘。各位车迷朋友们，今天我们来聊聊一个永恒的话题：如何智选车款，享受无忧驾乘。这个问题自从第一辆汽车诞生以来，就困扰着人类。直到今天，尽管我们有了更多的科技和信息，选择合适的车款依然像是在迷宫中寻找出口。首先，我们得承认，买车这件事对于大多数人来说，不仅仅是交通工具的选择，更是一种生活态度的体现。你是选择一辆能够穿梭在都市丛林中的小巧轿车？还是一辆能够征服山川河流的越野车，是追求速度与激情的跑车，还是注重实用与空间的家用车？这些选择背后，其实都是对生活方式的一种投票。但是，让我们回到省心省力的主题上来。要想做到这一点，我们得考虑几个关键因素。第一，可靠性。一辆好车，首先得是一辆不折腾人的车。选择那些口碑良好、故障率低的品牌和车型，可以大大减少你在路边等拖车的时间。二、维护成本，有些车看起来很美，价格也诱人，但维护起来却让你的钱包大出血。选择那些保养成本相对较低、配件易得的车款，可以让你在享受驾驶乐趣的同时，不用担心后续的花销。三、油耗，随着油价的不断攀升，油耗成了不得不考虑的重要因素。一辆省油的车，不仅能够减少你的经济负担，也是对环境负责的表现。四、安全性，无论你的车有多快。多酷，多省油！如果不安全，那一切都是徒劳。选择那些在碰撞测试中表现优异的车款，确保你和你的家人能够安全到达目的地。五、适用性，买车就像是选鞋，最合脚的才是最好的。根据你的生活习惯、家庭需求以及驾驶习惯，选择最适合你的车款。现在，让我们来讲一个有趣的故事。有一位朋友，他决定买一辆新车。他研究了各种车评，对比了无数的参数，最后他选择了一辆看起来完美无缺的车。但是他忽略了一个重要的问题：他住在一个山区，而他选的这辆车虽然在城市中表现出色，但在爬坡时却显得力不从心。结果每次上坡时，他都得祈祷不要遇到红灯，否则车子可能就要退回到山脚下了。所以，亲爱的朋友们，选择车款时，别忘了考虑你的实际使用环境。否则，你可能就会像我那位朋友一样，虽然有一辆看起来很棒的车，但每次开车都像是在进行一场冒险。最后，记住，智选车款，享受无忧驾乘，不仅仅是选择一辆车那么简单，更是一种对生活智慧的运用。祝大家都能找到那个能陪伴你畅游人生道路的四轮伙伴。谢谢小六子的介绍，亲爱的观众朋友们，今天我们聊了三个有关汽车的话题。座驾调音师、轻松卖车客以及省心省力的智选车款。通过这三个话题，我们了解了座驾调音师是如何打造完美驾驶音效的，卖车时我们应该如何避开低价陷阱，以及选择合适的车款时需要注意的因素。座驾调音师是汽车设计和制造过程中默默无闻的英雄，他们为我们的驾驶体验带来了音乐和情感的旅程。在卖车时，我们需要了解市场，自检车况。精心准备广告，掌握谈判技巧，不急于成交，并且了解法律和过户手续。而在选择车款时，我们需要考虑可靠性、维护成本、油耗、安全性和适用性等因素，确保能够享受无忧驾乘。最后，我想跟大家说一句：选择一辆合适的车款，不仅仅是为了满足交通工具的需求，更是对生活态度的一种表达。所以在选择车款时，不妨多思考一下你的生活方式和实际使用环境，这样才能找到那辆陪伴你畅游人生道路的四轮伙伴。好了，以上就是今天的内容。我相信，经过今天的分享，你一定对座驾调音师、卖车技巧和智选车款有了更深入的了解。如果你还有什么问题或者想法，欢迎在评论区留言，我会尽力回答。谢谢大家的观看，我们下次再见。愿你的驾驶之旅充满音乐和快乐。谢谢大家收看六度穿越系列节目。这个节目由媒体专业人士、科学家、工程技术人员编纂、设计、制作。但是，这些内容并非用于做出决策或法律裁定的基础。欢迎在节目留言区发表您的见解，纠正节目可能存在的错误。
，谢谢大家收看，欢迎订阅我们的频道，给我们节目点赞。观众朋友，大家好，欢迎收看今天的新风视线。周五，中国国家领导人习近平主持召开了中共中央政治局会议，主题为“分析研究2024年经济工作”。习近平在会上警告说，中国经济复苏仍处于关键阶段，并且承诺在新的一年里将通过进一步积极的财政政策和稳健的货币政策来支持中国经济的增长。习近平要求明年积极的财政政策要适度加力。稳健的货币政策则要精准有效。在习近平做出这番要求之际，中国数月来的经济数据可以说是好坏参半。出口在经历了长期下滑之后，在十一月终于略有回升，扭转了六个月的萎缩趋势。工业生产扩张，消费增加，尤其是食品行业的消费有所增加。为了继续鼓励消费，北京需要确保元旦和春节期间生活必需品价格稳定，并且确保农民工按时获得足额的工资。然而，房地产开发商和中小型贷款机构日益严重的财务困境，继续限制住房需求，并且削弱企业的信心。国内周期性和结构性的挑战可以说是相互叠加，任何政策宽松都可能受到中国结构性问题的限制，比如说人口老龄化和劳动力的萎缩。用新华社的话说，中国面临的发展形势十分复杂。中国经济一直难以从严格的疫情管控以及房地产危机的影响中反弹，这些危机削弱了投资者和消费者的信心。因此，周五的政治局会议还表示，有必要加强经济宣传和舆论的引导。一些经济学家和分析人士透露，来自北京方面的压力越来越大，要求他们不要贬低中国经济，令他们无话可说。政府今年两次降息，以此来刺激企业增加借贷，放宽了购房者的贷款要求，并批准额外发行一万亿元人民币的新债来促进经济复苏。周五的政治局会议基调为继续支持2024年的经济增长，这是政策将进一步宽松的迹象。而随着房地产行业的低迷进入第三个年头，经济学家警告称，这可能会对其他行业产生溢出效应。中国金融监管局上周誓言将提供中长期的低成本资金来支持房地产市场，并且加强对中小银行的监管，来减少金融风险。而上个月底，中国大型财富管理公司中植企业集团宣布严重资不抵债。中植是中国规模最大的影子贷款机构之一。十一月二十二日，中植披露其资产约为两千亿元人民币，而负债则达到四千六百亿元。五天之后，北京警方开始对中植集团进行刑事调查，并且对中植系的多名员工采取了所谓刑事强制措施，也就是逮捕的意思。现在，该公司的两名高管已经失踪。中植集团旗下的中融国际信托公司的许多高收益投资产品也已经出现了违约，令人担心中国日益恶化的房地产低迷已经传导至金融市场。有两家大型国有金融机构开始介入，为中融提供援助。中植集团眼看就要成为中国多年来倒闭的规模最大的企业之一，在中国经济复苏乏力、股市萎靡不振之际，中植的倒闭可能会进一步打击投资者的信心。据熟悉内情的消息人士称，过去几周购买了中植系产品的投资者聚集在网上和线下，试图向中植集团施压，要求他偿还借款。但是分析师表示，投资者能够拿回的资金比例将会非常非常低。中植系的金融产品主要是迎合富裕投资者的需求。据《华尔街日报》看到的一些产品的营销文件称，客户选购中植产品时的投资额需要达到至少约三百万元人民币。文件显示，中植去年提供的年回报率高达百分之七至百分之八，而这些中植基金在选择投资标的方面几乎没有任何限制。中国政府现在面临的问题是。中植集团是中国所谓的影子银行体系的重要组成部分。截至二零二三年六月底，中国庞大的影子银行总计管理着超过三万亿美元的资产。影子银行长期以来也一直是中国房地产开发商获取融资的一个重要来源。影子银行也就是指传统银行以外的借贷机构。这类机构在中国大量存在，比如说小额贷款公司、信用担保公司，甚至是典当行。仅在2017年，中国的典当行就放贷达到430亿美元。
这也就意味着政府需要管理众多影子银行的倒闭或者重组，同时还要确定其破产的刑事责任。在中国这场多层面的经济危机当中，倒闭的影子银行将不可能只有中指一家。影子银行的活动并不一定违法，但是所涉及的机构有时候会做违法的事情。他们为传统银行躲避监管提供了工具。2015年的一份报告估计，中国有三分之二的影子银行活动是利用传统银行的资金开展的。当监管机构阻止传统银行涉足一些可能盈利的行业时，他们就转而利用影子银行来发放贷款。其中一些业务属于合法金融业务，但是许多其他业务则属于灰色地带。比如说，一些活动未经监管机构的正式批准，但是并不违反中国的法律。影子银行的灰色程度各不相同。中国最大的影子银行之一是一家由政府经营的资产公司。影子银行为中国的中小型企业提供了更加便捷的信贷流动，而中小型企业是影子银行的主要借款人。2008年金融危机爆发之后，巨额的经济刺激计划导致中国信贷大幅增长，影子银行的作用也随之飙升。这些资金大部分投向了房地产市场，开发商因此获得了宽松的信贷，后来又流入了股票和大宗商品市场。但是在风险变大之后，中国金融监管机构开始收紧规则，传统银行也转变了做法。龙鼎集团的分析师表示，监管机构开始打击影子银行之后，新的监管规定产生了两个副作用。首先，由于私营企业，尤其是中小企业，更加难以获得信贷，导致经济增长放缓；其次，中国房地产的泡沫则越吹越大。在谈到中国的影子银行时，外交政策网站最新的一篇分析文章指出，现在中国面临的一个长期存在的问题是，打击影子银行的监管机构要弄清楚，在打击过程中将损害到谁的利益，以及谁可以被取缔。比如说， 2018年对 P2P 借贷行业的清理，主要影响到的是那些沉迷于手机理财软件的普通民众。政府当时的任务是控制公众对欺诈行为的愤怒。镇压一些抗议活动，并且向受到影响的个人提供部分的赔偿。但是中植系的情况则不同，中植系的投资者是富有的个人，甚至是一些与中国共产党的高层有联系的企业客户。打击中植系将令这些人面临巨大的损失。对于北京来说，如何在不进一步破坏经济或者影响高官巨额财富的情况下清理影子银行，是一个艰难的任务。业内人士表示。中国房地产行业的下滑可能会给更多的影子银行带来压力，但是他们也指出，与中国的整个金融体系相比，影子银行的规模仍然相对较小，因此有些分析师认为溢出效应的严重程度可能有限。另外一方面，最新的政治局会议中，官方没有透露是否讨论了明年的 GDP 增长目标。中国今年将 GDP 增长目标定为 5% 经济学家推测，北京可能会将2024年的目标设定在同一水平。但是他们警告，鉴于中国经济增长缺乏力量，要实现这一增长需要大量的刺激政策。国际货币基金组织在十一月的最新评估中则预计，二零二四年中国经济将增长百分之四点六，低于二零二三年百分之五点四的预测。花旗分析师在一份研究报告中指出，周五的政治局会议的措辞表明，在中国政府多年强调稳定之后，其政策倾向已经转向积极进步。其中包括经济增长，但花旗的研究报告不认为北京会采取大规模的刺激措施，因为中国发展的前提条件是稳定、国家安全和地缘政治的议程。政治局会议之后，汇丰的研报则认为，除了刺激房地产市场的政策之外，预计北京将会继续加大财政支持力度，同时货币政策可能会继续保持宽松。汇丰写道：“中国的内需复苏仍然需要更多的支撑。”以上就是今天新风视线的全部内容，感谢您的收看。这里是华尔街电视，如果喜欢，记得点赞并且订阅我们的频道。我们下期节目再见。U.S. President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping must now contemplate their geopolitical objectives for 2024. The coming year promises to be complex and turbulent, bookend by elections in Taiwan in January and the United States in November. At their meeting, the two leaders hammered out a low-level truce to halt the slide in bilateral relations, at least for now.
In Washington, many observers are convinced Biden has more reasons to be pleased than Xi Jinping. The U.S. side won commitments on issues such as restrictions on Chinese fentanyl exports and the reopening of previously shuttered military-to-military -military talks. Xi Jinping, by contrast, seem to have arrived weakened by China's domestic problems and poor economic outlook. At first glance, Beijing won little in the way of concessions. But if the United States did so well out of the summit, why was China so happy? That Beijing was pleased should be clear from how Chinese media covered the meeting. State-controlled outlets trumpeted a new San Francisco vision. The summit was strategically significant and far-reaching and left a unique and profound mark in the history of China-U.S. relations, as the Global Times put it. Even if fawning media coverage of Xi Jinping and his efforts is the usual procedure in China, the underlying truth is that Beijing feels it achieved a strategic success. That Washington thinks otherwise could prove to be a risky misunderstanding. China had three main objectives at the meeting, all of which it achieved. First was the simple fact of the summit itself. This provided a stage on which domestic and international audiences could view Xi Jinping as a global leader on par with Biden. As the rising and still less powerful nation, it matters to China to be seen as the United States peer. The second, more important issue was Taiwan. China is nervous about Taiwan's national elections in January, where polls suggest that the most likely outcome is a victory for the ruling Democratic Progressive Party, which has frosty relations with Beijing. Xi Jinping is also likely alarmed by Biden's repeated statements that the U.S. military would come to Taiwan's defense if China decides to invade. For Xi Jinping, reinforcing China's red lines on Taiwan to Biden face-to-face -face was therefore a central objective. And while Biden ruffled Chinese feathers in San Francisco by calling Xi Jinping a dictator, he crucially did not repeat his promise to defend Taiwan. Beijing, which never rules out the option of invading the island if it refuses to reunify voluntarily, will have been pleased by what it is likely to view as Biden's backing down. The third successful result for Beijing is that diffusing tensions with Washington will give it more room to maneuver in the South China Sea and elsewhere around the region, by at least temporarily slowing down the rebalancing that has seen many countries across the Indo-Pacific inch closer to each other and the United States. In recent years, Washington has pursued a successful allies and partners strategy to ratchet up pressure on Beijing. Xi Jinping has complained about containment, encirclement, and suppression, a good indication that Washington's plan to isolate China was working. The decision of countries like the Philippines to move closer to the United States is in large part a response to repeated aggressive behavior from China. Yet these allies and partners rarely want a worse relationship with China than the United States itself is willing to bear. Already, Australia has moved to reset ties following the visit of Prime Minister Anthony Albanese to Beijing earlier this month. China will soon hold a summit meeting with Japan and South Korea, potentially calming things in Northeast Asia, too. For Beijing, a temporary truce with Washington therefore provides the strategic benefit of reducing pressure across much of the rest of the region. This will allow it to focus on other objectives next year. This will include continuing to put pressure on the Philippines in the South China Sea, for instance, following recent clashes over 2nd Thomas Shoal. It will also include pushing for Chinese membership in the 11-Nation Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Pact, a move that some existing members, like Australia and Japan, have previously wanted to avoid. More generally, China will seek to expand the influence of its own plans to develop deeper bilateral ties around Asia, including by expanding its global security initiative and other mechanisms. Seen next to his successes, Xi Jinping likely cared less about the economic dimensions of the U.S.-Chinese relationship than Western observers seem to think. China's struggling economy made it appear as if Xi Jinping somehow had to come, cap in hand, to seek U.S. investment. Yet this makes little sense. A few new deals with U.S. blue chips for foreign direct investment, if they ever occur, will hardly be material to China's future. Indeed, Xi Jinping has been preparing for a world in which the United States invests much less in China. Rather, Xi Jinping's main aim is to stop and reverse damaging embargoes that limit China's access to advanced Western technology and enlisting corporate America to pressure Washington to achieve this end. 
This also explains why Beijing backed vague new government talks on artificial intelligence, which it also hopes might stave off more restrictions on its ability to acquire the semiconductors needed to run big AI models. Restarting military to military talks, which China shut down after then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan last year, was more of a concession to the United States. Biden's team wanted to reopen the communications channel, in part to manage possible accidents in the South China Sea or elsewhere. China's view is that such de escalation mechanisms could give legitimacy to U.S. military activities in what Beijing considers its exclusive sphere of influence. But ultimately, Beijing decided that there was little harm in restarting such contacts, which are unlikely to constrain China's assertive behavior. Only days after the summit, the Australian government asserted that a Chinese warship had injured several Australian divers with sonar pulses inside Japan's exclusive economic zone. In an actual crisis, low-level hotlines and working groups are unlikely to be much use. Without being too cynical about it, one benefit of reopening these channels for China is that Beijing can easily cancel them again whenever it needs to signal displeasure at Washington. With both sides pleased by the summit, it is of course possible that San Francisco provided a rare win-win outcome, to use the hackneyed diplomat speak employed by China's leaders. More likely, the satisfaction on both sides reflects different objectives and negotiating strategies. Back in 2019, before Kurt Campbell and Jake Sullivan became Biden's Asia czar and national security advisor, respectively, the two co-authored an essay on managing China. The United States, they argued, is often mistaken when it thinks China will respond to friendly overtures. Instead, a wise strategy would lead with competition to build leverage and extract concessions. This is just what the Biden administration has done. It has pressured China by working closely with its friends around the region. Chinese concessions, such as reopen military communication channels and fentanyl working groups, are the result. China is playing a different game. It wants to be seen as an equal great power. It wants to keep its options open on reunifying with Taiwan by military force if necessary. And it wants an unimpeded sphere of influence in its neighborhood. On this front, the San Francisco summit delivered. China did not concede anything that really matters. It bought time and breathing space, allowing it to pursue its regional objectives while the U.S. is distracted by its election next year. Yet the fundamental regional challenge remains. As Samir Saran of the Observer Research Foundation in New Delhi put it at a recent conference, China seeks a multipolar world order but a unipolar East Asia. The United States wants the opposite, it seeks to sustain its global unipolar position while ensuring East Asia remains multipolar. Deals like those struck in San Francisco can calm Sino-US relations temporarily. Just don't bet on them lasting. Xiaoshan 第二步，如图选择六度万事，我们未来将推出更多的AI供大家选择，然后就可以与六博士悄悄畅谈了，还支持论坛内部信息搜索哦。您还可以让六博士做你的助手，帮你绘制漂亮图片。最后，可以点击
。各位听众，今天我们来聊一个非常有趣的现象——传统制造业的华丽转身。想象一下，一个穿着老派工作服、手上沾满机油的制造业，突然一跃成为穿着西装、手拿智能手机的现代企业家。这不仅是一个形象的转变，更是一场深刻的产业革命。首先，我们得认识一下这位老朋友——传统制造业。这位老兄曾经是经济增长的主力军，但随着时间的推移，他开始显得有些力不从心。竞争对手年轻力壮，技术更新换代快，消费者口味变化大，这让我们的老朋友感到了前所未有的压力。然而，就在大家以为传统制造业将逐渐退出历史舞台时，一些企业开始了惊人的转型之旅。他们开始抛弃那些过时的生产方式，拥抱数字化。自动化、智能化，这就像是给老树注入了新的生命力，让它重新开花结果。这些企业开始利用大数据分析市场趋势，用机器人和自动化设备提高生产效率，用物联网技术实现设备的远程监控和维护。他们甚至开始探索使用 3D 打印技术来制造产品，这不仅大大缩短了产品从设计到生产的时间，还能够实现个性化定制，满足消费者的独特需求。这场转型不仅仅是技术上的革新，更是商业模式上的重大突破。一些企业开始从单纯的制造商转变为服务提供商，提供从产品设计、制造到维护的一站式解决方案。这种模式不仅增加了客户粘性，也为企业带来了更加稳定的收入流。当然，转型的过程中也充满了挑战，企业需要投入大量的资金和人力进行技术升级。员工需要接受新技能的培训，企业文化也需要进行相应的调整。但是，对于那些能够成功转型的企业来说，这一切的努力都是值得的。股价的上升就是市场对这些企业转型成功的最好认可。投资者看到了这些企业的未来潜力，纷纷拿出钱包投票支持。这就像是给这些老树浇上了一桶桶的肥料，让他们生长得更加茁壮。最后。我们可以这么说，传统制造业的转型就像是一部精彩的电影，有着跌宕起伏的剧情和令人振奋的结局。而那些成功转型的企业，就是这部电影中的主角。他们用智慧和勇气证明了，即使是最传统的行业，也能够在创新的浪潮中焕发新生。谢谢小六子的介绍。那再跟我们介绍一下，食品巨头收购新创，扩展版图。好的，让我们来聊聊这个美食界的大鱼吃小鱼的故事。想象一下，你是一条游得不错的小鱼，在食品创新的大海中快乐的游弋。你有一个绝妙的点子，也许是一种能在月球上生长的超级藻类，或者是一种用虚拟现实技术烹饪的全新料理方式。你的创意引起了轰动，小小的泡泡在水面上引起了涟漪。然而，在这片海洋的深处，有些大鱼、食品巨头，他们游得慢，但吃得多，而且总是在寻找新鲜的美食来填满他们那永不满足的胃。这些巨头有助丰富的资源和庞大的分销网络，但他们缺乏一样东西——创新。于是，当这些食品巨头发现了你，那个创新的小鱼，他们的眼睛就亮了起来。他们开始围绕住你游动，发出葛中诱人的信号：合作的机会、资金的承诺，甚至是完全收购的提议。这时候，小鱼你面临一个抉择：是继续在这片开阔的海洋中冒险，还是接受大鱼的拥抱？让自己的创意在他们的保护下茁壮成长。有些小鱼选择了后者，他们的创意被整合进了大鱼的菜单中，并且得到了更广泛的推广。但这个过程并不总是那么甜蜜。有时候，大鱼的胃口太大，他们吞下了小鱼，却没有好好消化。创新的火花在大公司的官僚体系中逐渐熄灭，那些曾经闪闪发光的点子变得平淡无奇。然而，也有一些小鱼在大鱼的庇护下茁壮成长。他们的创意得到了实现，甚至改变了整个食品行业的游戏规则。这就像是一场美食界的权力的游戏，每个角色都在为了生存和繁荣而奋斗。所以，亲爱的听众，下次当你在超市的架子上看到一个新奇的食品品牌时，不妨想一想背后的故事。那可能是一个小鱼的梦想，也可能是一条大鱼的晚餐。不管怎样，这个故事提醒我们，在食品界的大海中，创新是永远的生存法则。谢谢小六子的介绍，那再跟我们介绍一下药品公司突破性药物获批，股价飙升。好的，让我们来谈谈这个让投资者心跳加速、科学家兴奋不已、病患满怀希望的话题：药品公司的突破性药物获得批准，股价随之攀升至云端。首先，想象一下这样的场景。
，在一个充满试管和闪烁荧幕的实验室里，一群穿着白大褂的科学家们正紧盯住一个含有神秘液体的试管。这不是普通的液体，而是他们多年研究的结晶，一种可能治愈某种顽固疾病的突破性药物。经过无数次的实验和临床试验，这个小小的试管内的药物终于准备好要走出实验室，进入市场。当监管机构，比如美国的食品药品监督管理局 （FDA） 宣布批准这种药物时，这不仅仅是科学界的一个胜利，也是药品公司的一个巨大胜利。这个消息就像是在股市上投下了一枚重磅炸弹，随即引发了一场股价的狂欢。为什么股价会飙升呢？这是因为市场对于这种新药充满了期待，投资者们开始幻想住这个药物将会带来的庞大收益。毕竟。治疗一种疾病的突破性药物，往往意味着可以对病患收取高昂的价格，而且如果没有竞争对手，那么这家公司就拥有了一个金矿。但是，就像所有好戏一样，这场狂欢也可能会有一个意想不到的结局。有时候，这些药物在市场上的表现可能不如预期，或者出现了一些意外的副作用，导致股价从云端跌落，让那些一夜之间变成纸面富翁的投资者们感到头疼不已。不过，当一切顺利时，这种突破性药物的成功上市不仅能够为公司带来巨大的财富，更重要的是，它能够改变病患的生活，甚至挽救生命。这就是为什么即使股市的起伏让人眼花缭乱，那些致力于创造新药的科学家们仍然坚持不懈的工作，因为他们知道，他们的努力远远超过了股票图表上的那些起起落落。好的，让我们来聊聊这个壮举。想象一下，你是一个药品公司的研发团队成员，你们花费了数年时间，不眠不休的努力研究一种新药物，希望它能够治愈一种罕见的疾病，或者是提供一种更有效的治疗方法。你们在实验室里进行了无数次的实验，耐心的等待着结果。终于一天，你们看到了令人振奋的消息：你们的新药获得了批准，可以投放市场了。这是一个突破性的成果。会给病人带来新的希望，也会给你们的公司带来巨大的机会。当这个消息公布出来的时候，股价立刻飙升。投资者看到了这个新药的潜力，相信这个公司将会有一个光明的未来。这就像是一个魔法，把曾经平凡无奇的公司变成了人人称羡的明星。但是，我们也不能忽视这个过程中的辛苦和努力。研发一个新药需要巨大的资金投入和耐心等待，这是一个风险极高的领域。许多药品研发项目以失败告终，只有极少数能够成功。所以，这个突破性的药物获批并不是偶然，而是无数科学家和研究人员的心血结晶。最后，我们可以这么说：这个故事告诉我们，在医药界，创新是非常重要的。只有不断的进行研究和实验，才能够带来新的突破和进步。这些突破不仅能够改变病人的生活，也能够给公司带来巨大的回报。谢谢小六子的介绍，那再跟我们介绍一下智能手机市场竞争白热化，你有什么样的想法呢？大家好，我是六度世界的六博士，我与小六子为大家主持《华尔街故事》节目，主要内容包括：一、市场对价值股重新燃起兴趣；二、债券收益率上升，股市受压。三消费者信心下滑，零售股受挫。那么，小六子可以先跟我们说说市场对价值股重新燃起兴趣。各位听众，今天我们来聊一聊一个在投资界经久不衰的话题——市场对价值股的爱恨情仇。这就像是一部经典的爱情电影，主角们分分合合，总是在观众快要放弃希望的时候又重燃了爱火。首先，让我们来定义一下什么是价值股。价值股就像是那种老实、可靠、稳重的邻家男孩，他们可能不像成长股那样光鲜亮丽，不会开豪车，不会穿潮牌，但他们有助稳定的收入、低债务，而且价格合理。简单来说，价值股就是那些市场似乎低估了其真正价值的股票。那么，为什么市场会对这些老实人重新燃起兴趣呢？这里面有几个原因。首先，当市场经历了一段时间的高速成长。特别是那些高飞的科技股之后，投资者开始担心这些股票的价格是否已经过高，就像是在派对上狂欢过后，大家开始寻找一瓶解酒的药水。其次，当经济前景不确定或者利率开始上升，投资者就会寻找那些能够提供稳定现金流的公司。价值股通常有助稳健的财务状况和持续的股息支付。
。这就像是在经济的大海中，有一艘坚固的船，能够帮助投资者稳住阵脚。最后，不要忘了市场情绪的影响。投资者有时候就像是追星族，他们会追逐那些当红炸子鸡，但当风向一变，昨日的明星可能就朝不保夕了。这时候，那些一直默默无闻的价值股就会成为新的宠儿。所以。当市场对价值股重新燃起兴趣的时候，这不仅仅是一种投资策略的转变，这其实也反映了投资者心理和市场情绪的微妙变化。这就像是在一场长跑比赛中，那些一开始落后的选手，凭借着耐力和毅力，最终迎头赶上，甚至超过了那些起跑时飞快的选手。当然，价值投资并不是一帆风顺的，就像是那个邻家男孩，有时候他可能会被忽视，有时候他的稳重可能会被误解为缺乏激情。但是，当市场的浮躁和短视逐渐褪去，价值股的真正价值终将被发现，就像是那个在电影结尾得到女主角芳心的邻家男孩一样。所以，亲爱的投资者，下次当你在股市中寻宝时，不妨多留意那些被市场忽略的价值股。谁知道呢？也许下一个市场的明星就是他们。记住，有时候真爱就藏在不起眼的角落里。谢谢小六子的介绍。那再跟我们介绍一下，债券收益率上升，股市受压。好的，让我们以一种轻松的方式来探讨这个财经世界中的经典情节：债券收益率上升，股市感到了压力。想象一下，股市，我们称它为股市史蒂夫，和债券市场，我们叫它债券贝蒂，是一对老朋友。他们在金融市场这个大舞台上共舞已久。股市史蒂夫是那种喜欢冒险、追求刺激的家伙。而债券贝蒂则是稳重而可靠的类型，他喜欢安全和预测性。一天，债券贝蒂决定提高他的魅力，也就是他的收益率。这是因为经济环境变化了，或许是因为通胀上升，或者是中央银行决定提高利率来对抗这种通胀。无论原因为何，债券贝蒂变得更有吸引力了，他的稳定回报让投资者心动。这时，股市史蒂夫开始感到焦虑，他习惯于成为投资者的宠儿。凭借他那令人兴奋的成长潜力和可能的高回报，但现在投资者开始转向债券贝蒂，因为他提供了一个更加吸引人的安全选择。毕竟，如果你可以从债券贝蒂那里得到一个不错的、相对稳定的回报，为什么还要冒着股市史蒂夫的波动风险呢？随着越来越多的投资者被债券贝蒂的魅力所吸引，股市史蒂夫开始感受到压力，它的价格可能会下跌。因为投资者卖出股票，转而购买债券，这就是经济学中的资产替代效应。投资者在不同资产类别之间权衡回报和风险，并做出选择。但这个故事还没有结束，股市史蒂夫可能会进行一些调整，企业可能会努力提高效率、增加股息，或者发展新的增长策略来吸引投资者回来。而债券贝蒂，他可能会发现自己的魅力不是永恒的，特别是如果经济环境再次变化。或者通胀得到控制，中央银行降低利率。在这个永无止境的金融舞会上，股市史蒂夫和债券贝蒂将继续他们的舞蹈，有时是和谐的双人舞，有时则是一场激烈的角力。投资者们就像观看这场舞会的观众，必须保持警觉，随时准备调整他们的舞步，以跟上这对舞伴的节奏。谢谢小六子的介绍，那再跟我们介绍一下，消费者信心下滑，零售股受挫。好的，让我们以一种轻松的方式来探讨这个看似沉重的话题：消费者信心下滑，零售股受挫。想象一下，消费者信心就像是一场盛大的舞会，而消费者们是那些穿着华丽礼服的舞者。当音乐、经济、悦耳动听，大家都信心满满的在舞池、市场中翩翩起舞，转住圈圈，买住东西。零售商们就像是舞会的主办者，看住这场盛况，他们的脸上洋溢住笑容。因为他们知道，只要舞会继续，他们的口袋就会越来越鼓。但是，当经济的音乐开始走调，或者有些不和谐的音符出现，比如说失业率上升、物价飞涨，消费者们开始感到不安，他们的舞步变得犹豫，不再那么轻快。他们开始担心自己的钱包是否足够支撑这场无休止的购物舞会。这时候，消费者信心就像是受了点小伤的舞者，决定坐到一旁休息一下，而不是继续在舞池中旋转。当越来越多的舞者选择休息，零售商们的脸色就开始变得难看。他们的收入来源，那些快乐的舞者正在减少。这时候，股市就像是那个喜欢在背后传小道消息的八卦者，开始散播关于舞会可能提早结束的消息。
，零售股票就像是舞会上的热门舞伴，突然间变得不那么受欢迎了。股市的投资者，他们就像是那些喜欢赌博的宾客，开始压住哪些舞伴会最先离场。他们对零售股失去信心，开始卖出手中的股票，导致股价下跌。这就是零售股受挫的情景。一场原本热闹非凡的舞会，因为气氛的转变，变得有些冷清。不过，就像任何好的故事一样，总有转机的可能。如果经济的节奏再次变得和谐，或者有新的政策来提振消费者信心，那些坐在一旁的舞者可能会重新站起来，重新加入舞池。零售商们的笑容会再次回到脸上，而股市的赌客们也会重新压住于这些曾经不受欢迎的舞伴。所以，亲爱的听众，这就是消费者信心与零售股之间的舞蹈，它是一场充满了期望。失望和可能的再次振兴的循环，而我们作为旁观者或者参与者，总是希望音乐永远悦耳，舞会永远继续。谢谢小六子的介绍。所以，当你听到消费者信心下滑、零售股受挫时，不要过于悲观，这只是市场中的一个情节，而且它也不是一成不变的。经济总是有起伏，投资者总是有情绪。我们可以从中学到很多东西，并且随时准备调整我们的舞步。你有什么样的想法？你对价值股重新燃起兴趣的市场趋势有什么看法？你如何看待债券收益率上升对股市的影响？你对消费者信心下滑对零售股的影响有什么想法？让我们一起来讨论吧。谢谢大家收看六度穿越系列节目。这个节目由媒体专业人士。科学家、工程技术人员编纂、设计、制作，但是这些内容并非用于做出决策或法律裁定的基础。欢迎在节目留言区发表您的见解，纠正节目可能存在的错误。谢谢大家收看，欢迎订阅我们的频道，给我们节目点赞。